Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Scarborough Town Council uh, workshop for January 17th, 2018. This is an annual event that we conduct, uh, effort to identify goals uh, and action items uh, uh, for the Town Council. Uh, we had a team of outside professionals uh, this year who helped us with our retreat uh, recently, a week ago, uh, very successful, and they also took on the responsibility of doing uh, phone interviews that were half hour, 45 minutes each, uh, and included uh, asking each counselor what were their goals. So uh, we have the process well along. Uh, we're going to work from the list that was prepared by the uh, consultants. Uh, we have some overheads uh, to assist us in that process, and I think we're going to see if we can find action plans and ways to measure success uh, for uh, accomplishing the goals that we have arrived at. There was a pretty good consensus, I think, amongst the counselors as to what the goals would be. Uh, the town manager will join me in uh, moderating this so that uh, as, as is typical. Uh, so I'm going to throw it to Tom Hall. Sure. Uh, just to be clear for members of the public here and those at home, the council had no discussion whatsoever of these goals at the retreat. All of this information, and it's unadulterated. Uh, what I'm showing tonight is what the consultants provided us, and it was the results at least through their lens, what they heard uh, kind of synthesized different themes through the various interviews individually with, with you. So you as a group are seeing this for the first time. I think you've all seen them and read them yourselves, but now you'll have a chance to talk about it. And it given the work that was put into this, um, it does make sense to at least start with this as a conversation point. I, I don't know if it needs to be the uh, totality of what you talk about, but I think it does hit some of the major milestones or signposts that have been talked about in recent years, uh, not surprisingly, so it seems like a very logical place to start the conversation. So I have printed handouts uh, of what I'll show you here, and again, these are verbatim, um, what the consultants recorded and how they characterize the themes. certainly would encourage everyone to comment on uh, the uh, workshop that we had, the retreat we had, and what your own takeaway from that was so that people can sort of hear, what do we do and, and how did you react to it? Do you want to take a moment and do some sharing on that point now? Or? Sure. In terms of how the retreat went? Why don't... Why don't uh, uh, I'll start by by noting that we spent a lot of time working on uh, 
trying to understand how to address conflict situations where you're hearing something from uh, a constituent that may not be exactly what you're uh, thinking. And we talked a lot about listening. Uh, we did some role playing that I thought was very effective. Uh, and uh, uh, my takeaway from uh, from the effort at looking at civil discourse was that we all learned from the experience. Katie, why don't we start over here with you? We'll go around. Sure. Um, I thought it, the consultants did an excellent job uh, facilitating the session. Uh, it was well planned. I appreciated all my fellow counselors really showing up and digging in. It was clear, you know, we, we had different even differences among us, and uh, and I think we were able to kind of find some ways to look and listen to each other in a new way, which I think is going to make us more effective as a group. So I was excuse me, um, very pleased with the, the session overall and, and the work that we did there. Well, so I, I think um, uh, the, big, the thing I most appreciated about it was um, really the discussions around civil discourse and that not just... Um, interacting with each other, but how we can reach out to the public. I think one of the main things that um, of the discussions that I was involved in while we were there was a lot about how we um, do more proactive outreach and, and listening to the, to the public in general and then also with each other. Uh, I don't want to repeat what mm -hmm. I agree with everything both of you have said. I know one of my biggest takeaways was when you when you're in a political body, you're not always going to agree. That's just the way it is. Um, sometimes you're going to have uh, seven zero votes. Sometimes you're going to have five two votes. Sometimes you're going to have split decisions or whatever. But it's just it was good reminder that that's okay. You know, well, you just try to bring everyone along, and if you don't, everyone needs to be respectful of each other's positions. So I thought that was very good. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll concur with what's been said all so far. I thought it was a productive uh, use of time. I would have liked to have seen more time doing it. I think maybe for future reference, we, we take a, you know, maybe we bite the bullet and take a Saturday and spend a day doing it or something where, I mean, I think it's that important and that, that valuable a takeaway. Um, I think the consultants did a, 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 an admirable job for the amount of time that they had. Um, and, you know, this is the second time that I've gone through this, and I think every time you take away something a little different, and I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not Pollyannish to think that the world's going to change now because of one meeting, but I think if, you know, if I try and keep a hold of one or two things that we learn and build off of that, then I think it's a positive thing, so. Yeah, and I guess I'd kind of echo what everybody else has said. I thought it, I thought it was a great use of time. Um, the exercise I really liked, which I thought was really interesting, is they kind of had us to rock, you know, arraign ourselves as sort of our ideology and where we stood on just different ways of looking at things. And there was a wide spectrum, which is not surprising. We're all individuals. And then they really had us try to listen to why we lined up where we did and then have the other the others that were in a different place repeat back what they heard. <laughs> and that was a real eye opening experience for at least me personally. It's really hard to listen. It's really hard not to put your own interpretation on what you hear. And we had some of that, so it was just a great learning about how do you really listen and be totally present to what the other party is saying, so you can really appreciate where they are. That, to me, was a really powerful experience, and so I thought they did a great job. I would echo, I think, it would be interesting to see. We did it one year, we didn't do it the second year, we did it this year. It would be really curious to see if that helps us kind of communicate, figure out how to communicate with our, with our constituents. So I thought it was a great, great exercise. Tom, what were your takeaways? Well, much the same. I congratulate you even carving out the two and a half hours you did. I know it's hard to do, but um, I was reminded how important it is. And I think the year is going to go by like this. You're going to be confronted with some predictable challenges, some unpredictable ones. And I think everything you could do to prepare yourself for those situations, the, you'll be better for it. So uh, I thought it was time very well spent. The uh, uh, two professionals who assisted us in this exercise are community members, so uh, nice to always applaud people who are uh, giving us more than enough time. The amount of time they put in uh, really was tremendous. Uh, uh, John Shorp and Dana Morris-Jones.
with the two individuals, and that that why I think we all would like to express our appreciation to them, Chris. Yeah, and if I could add too, I think it it, it was valuable for me too to realize that you know they are they are part of the community and they have seen us deliberating before and have actually watched the, a few of the meetings, so they have a real kind of um, broad understanding and a, and a real real take on watching the dynamics and the interactions and so I thought that that helps a lot with their recommendations not just canned recommendations of mm -hmm. you know you know uh, consultant 101 says you should do X Y and Z because that's the right thing to do they can look at our our processes and our the way we would do things and, and give real live examples of hey you know here here's what, what did you think was happening here because here's what it might look like <laughs> Uh, Councilor Baymine had uh, uh, clement weather conditions on the roadway <laughs> home has uh, just arrived. So, uh, Sean, why don't you give us your two cents on uh, I swear it snows harder in, Biddeford, or in uh, your county than it does here because the roads were absolutely horrible. It's <laughs> just wherever you want. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, you know, it always, you know, it rains down to me. Um, as far as um, observations, I thought it was a, a well-run, um, well-thought-out uh, exercise. I was a little nervous walking in thinking, oh, this is going to be what we did before, and it was not the same at all. So um, there was a lot of introspective um, that went with that, um, and so I really appreciated what the work that was done. You know, you're never really going to know how successful it was until at the end of the year when you sit back and look at, you know, how did we apply what was learned or at least what was listened um, in that exercise. So I'm optimistic. Um, and if the five items that are up on there are the topics of our goals, I think that our conversations were very um, well listened to by the consultants as well because that encapsulates everything I was thinking of. So, Thank you. I'm a little surprised that no one said they like the charity stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a lot of oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, Sean, what these are, are the lens for the consultants. Yep. These were the things that they heard like, you know, through the seven conversations they had with you individually. And what I suggest we do is kind of work through those themes. There's some uh, subtext with each of them. And if, if that's uh, an acceptable format, we can start with that. And I would encourage some conversation. Does that still make sense? Uh, I wouldn't suggest, I don't know, but I don't believe that the, that all of these are even consensus necessarily. I think they're through the lens of the consultant. Uh, they seem to align themselves. So uh, ideally, you'd work through and, and agree that these make sense or if not change them. So starting with the first one, starting with the first one. <laughs> it's asleep. I know. I don't know. I was going to say. Uh, All right. So subtext: uh, the first one they had recorded was uh, the finance tax and the budget was created long-term financial strategy for the town. Do you want to go through the list of all first and then drop out? Or you'll talk about it one by one. I think we should list them up first. List them up and we'll, we'll jump around and right. let people I'm have sure these questions. Are any order of priority? <laughs> you want to turn on sticky keys? Hmm. Escape. I'm going to have to. Why don't you look back at your. <laughs> there it is. Your printout. They're all right there for you to see. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Something is taking over the system here. Did you click on that Nigerian banker who needed help? <laughs> hey, he made me a prince today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, You'll see them all there. So under finance taxes and budget, here's one for strategy, uh, financial strategy for the town, tax relief for seniors, keep tax increase below 3%, and approve budget at first vote. That budget theme you'll see resonates on two or three of these as you go through. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we would uh, prioritize by uh, uh, finance chair and uh, <laughs> finance members, but uh, I know this has been a matter of discussion at the finance committee, and so uh, I expect that this probably had some origins <laughs> in discussion to the fire. So, Peter, why don't you why don't you speak to this issue first, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, well, I think in particular the, the first bullet, which is really the long-term financial plan, I just add a little more detail around it. I think we have talked for several years of really trying to think about 
and we certainly have been asked by our constituents is not only is it a strategic plan, but it's almost almost a modeling of what do the outlying the next couple of years look like for our expenditures and tax rates and other things, sort of financial modeling. And I, and I think that's been a goal of the, of the Finance Committee for a year or two now. I think it started under Sean's leadership of really trying to, to get there. So I think that's where that bullet kind of encapsulates that. And I think it's a particularly important now that we've got the public safety building approved and we're starting to have some conversations about what the school might be doing with their primary, you know, primary school education. So, so I think that really plays to some of the themes that we've had. And, and I've, I've always thought that the capital improvement budget uh, was designed specifically to deal with a long range view of things. And so that has made a lot of sense to me uh, when the years that I was on the finance committee. And so, uh, and I've always thought that the this principle of let's stay below three percent and, and and really make an honest effort to do so was a long range strategy. If we could renew that bow every year, then we could say our expectation is five years from now we're still going to stay so that. Uh, on the expenditure side as opposed to the capital budget side, I sort of saw that as, as a poor man's long-term plan. Uh, but uh, on the capital budget side, we are already, if I'm correct, uh, uh, doing a long-term plan. And part of our exercise, I think under Sean last year, was to look at where are we with our capital projects? And we were trying to prioritize, and we did prioritize the municipal building, and that moved forward very successfully. So, others who, I mean, I guess my my take would be, uh, you know, I, I'm always very cautious on how we position these these discussions, only because I think we've always, at least my experience through the school board in two years here, we've always had a long term understanding. Uh, we've been able to do projections. If the real question is, is w w a, is that the right data to look at? And B, how fixed is that? Because it's the constant struggle of, you know, in a business, in a business world, you can, you can manage long-term finances. You have controlled investments. You have controlled expenditures. You can shrink and swell. You have a little bit more control over what you reduce and what you increase. And I, I think with budget, we have to have a little bit of inherent flexibility in those plans because there are a lot of things that we have to deal with that are unforeseen uh, and that are beyond our control. So I constantly struggle with the with not having the long-term predictability. I think that's critical in any situation. But how rigid is that long-term plan? Is it something that we say we have to be in a certain goal or at a certain outcome in two or three years? And it doesn't matter what the consequences of that are because that's the ultimate goal, or do we have something that's flexible enough that says if in a perfect world if everything's going the way that we hope and predict it will, then these are the outcomes we expect, but we have to have some kind of flexibility in there. So I don't want people to think that this is like an epiphany for us that all of a sudden we're saying, oh, we probably should have some long-term goals in mind. I think we've always had those. I think it's the emphasis that we put on them and, and then the, the, um, the, the, the rigidity in which we uh, we lock those plans in or present those plans, I think. Um, I think that the, the tax increase added below 3%. Again, I've heard a lot of people say that's kind of an arbitrary number. Where'd you pick it from? You know, why isn't it consumer price index or why isn't it uh, some other indices or something? And my recollection was, was that's not an arbitrary number. We actually, when we set that, I think two or three years ago, um, we had done a long-term analysis over, I think, Sean, 10 or 15 years or something like that. But I think Will's the one that did it for us. Uh, uh, like 10 years? Um, ten year so um, I recall doing some uh, research for us. I don't, I don't recall if, it, if this is where the 3% came yeah. from. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but definitely looking back, yeah. the numbers I looked at were over at least 10 years. Yeah, so I'm remembering that that 3% is tied. So that's a tax increase where the equivalence um, on the actual amount spent or spending is about four and a half percent. For some reason, those two numbers just pop out, yeah. and I don't recall why or how we got to that. But right. there was analysis done that supported it. Right. So my my point was is that was that, and you know, if, if I recall, the initial goal was to have predictable and sustainable implementation. Right. So we in the past we saw this giant seesaw curve of you know depending on where you were in the cycle, you had a seven or eight percent tax increase or zero. 
you know, um, and that that creates a lot of volatility with budgeting and planning and, and predictability. Mm -hmm. So we we did the analysis. We went through. It wasn't just we sat around and said, "How about three? No, no, I like four. No, no, I like right. one." And and it wasn't that kind of debate. I think there was thought behind it. So um, I, I I'm very comfortable with with maintaining that because I think when times are good, um, the three percent is is there to say, "Okay, we're not we're not you know." Times are good. They can we can chug along when times are bad. That three percent is an understanding that if we start going below that, then we start losing the ability to be flexible and, and maintain services and things like that. So I like I like that that approach and that concept. Um, but I also I also think that that it's again important to state that it's not an arbitrary number. It's something that that, that does have thought behind it and, and reasoning behind it. Let me and let me take up that the point that I made to all of you in, a, in an email that uh, the 3% the or below, staying below 3%, if we can possibly achieve that, I, I've liked it as a goal, and we've averaged for the last four years 2.9. So we, we actually have under arduous or demanding circumstances uh, uh, achieved that goal. Uh, but yet there is an element of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. a sense of a cloud uh, uh, over the process. And so my thought was, why don't we start there? Uh, let's, let's, let's ask the administration of this town, superintendent and the town manager, to see if they can achieve that at the outset. Now, we, have, we still have to then argue and debate, <coughs> well, no, this should be in. Well, if it is, something else has to come out. And, and but I think it's a better place to start because people are going to say, this isn't a game for these people, these seven town councilors. They're serious about that. So I throw that out there as an idea that might get thrown into as a, uh, a goal this year, as a sub, a sub goal, one that would, we would talk with the school board about. And I, I, I again, swing and I think you know it's also important that the tax increase is a revenue generation issue. Um, I think a lot of the budget discussions that we tend to get into is also what are the priorities for spending that, that revenue. And if we do get into a situation where we feel like um, the needs outweigh the, the 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 means, then then we start to have those discussions of what can we do and what can't we do. But I think if we and I know it's a balancing act between revenues and expenditures, but we've in the past been very much um, expenditure focused on on what do we cut, what do we where we postpone, what do we delay. And I think those are all viable discussions. I think that's a that's a good process to kind of weed out some of the the stronger needs versus some of the things that you know if we if we if we can maybe now is a good time to do it. Um, I've always thought that that healthy debate and process is good, especially with with with. Uh, constituent feedback because you know everybody has you know let's look at the beach cleaning for example right I mean you know for some people that was mm -hmm. uh, a viable thing to remove from the beach because it felt like it was not a necessity unless you were on the beach <laughs> and if you were a beach person you're your that was one of your higher priorities so it's it's always tough striking that balance between the, the priorities and needs of the community as a whole and not the individual ones and balancing that with the revenue to support those needs Others with the so I guess I would have some concern of, of the um, <coughs> asking that that first read buzzer proposal to come in um, at three percent uh, only because we've seen historically that often there's a lot of uncertainty around that budget and that you know a more concern when there's a range in order to um, uh, in order to not have a negative conversation later the the higher end of that range is chosen and so therefore we we typically see a tightening as we get further on and get better estimates as the time progresses. So I guess I'd have some concern if we were saying that, that we want that, that initial first read coming through. We have seen uh, the school board present new numbers as we went through the process where things, because they took a relatively conservative tack, they, uh, they then were able to add revenue uh, uh, in or an expense didn't turn out to be as great. I know we had I think health insurance, for instance, is often yes, one uh, where we just uh, don't know in you know so March when we put that. Forward. It's it's that it's those hard choices, and I I I just think we put all this effort in, and yet there's still people saying it's a game. 
and I and I think that's unfair to the people who are making the effort. Mm -hmm. I, I think it I think it boils down to trust, right? I mean, if 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 we have the trust of the community, um, and there's faith in the process, and they understand the intangibles that we're dealing with, then they believe we're making the right decisions and if ultimately the goal is at the end of the process to come out with something that looks like that I mean it's like making sausage right you got to put a bunch of stuff into the grinder you might not want to know what everything is that goes in there but you, you want the sausage to be a certain length and a certain size when it comes out so I, 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 I agree I think you know there's always challenges with trying to, to, to set a, an initial goal out there because of all the intangibles um, I don't know if it's if it's good to set a hard fast goal at the first reading and and then constrain ourselves that way, or if it's or if it's more important to say at the at the end of the process, and it is a process, it's always a process every year. That's where we want to end up because I think we did a, a, a pretty good effort this year with, with the joint meetings of saying you know here we're, and, we, and oftentimes we went back to staff and said you know we need something else we need we, you know here's where we're at. We understand everything that's going on, and we, we realize that these are some tough choices, but we really need to take that next next cut at it and come back with some, some real hard and fast numbers. And I think as painful as that might have been, I think it was well understood that that was the ultimate goal and that's the process we had to go through. And it was collaborative, too, which I think was important. It wasn't us making decisions arbitrarily or, or you know, uh, in, in, imposing things on other people. Others? John. So understanding that we have, I think there's five different topics with only a half an hour left, I'm going to summarize. I think three of the four items that are up here are achievable and I would support. It's the last one that I don't think is achievable and don't believe that's an appropriate goal because uh, we have simply no control. I don't agree, or I, um, sorry, I had a brain piece there. Um, I think that uh, the first two need to be uh, reworded slightly because I think it needs to, there, there's a larger focus. So rather than creating just a long-term financial strategy, I think that we need to create a financial strategy that manages the town's financial health because by no means are we perfect in the short-term strategy that we have today because we have several policies that we've created over time that aren't being employed or aren't being used and aren't being utilized uh, to their full extent, uh, whether it's about the capital budget <laughs> or we find certain parts in the operating side rather than you know, on the debt side or reserve accounts, funding depreciation, things, I mean, things that are permissible already and we're not doing anything. So I think there needs to be a look at both of those um, in order to be able to manage it. Number two is on the tax relief. I, I think that there's a bigger issue around tax relief and it's not just seniors. There are other, um, without getting into all the de details because, um, you know, there's so many different, but there are other uh, folks or there are other citizens or other groups that are also in need that are at risk, whether it's veterans, um, younger families who, you know, um, can't, you know, that are on welfare that can't afford it. So I think that it needs to be looked at as, in a bigger perspective um, <laughs> rather than just, it's not just about seniors, it's about tax relief for everyone that needs the relief. So. Unfortunately, statutorily, yeah. you have difficulty reaching into those other parts of your population. Mm -hmm. Seniors uh, are allowed through statute, um, and we have a very robust program that could be enhanced, if you wish. But I understand your point, and I agree with it, but I think coming up with a proactive strategy or program that we could administer and fund locally, um, I'm not aware whether you can do it for yeah. everyone in need. Yeah, the state, state statutes are pretty strict around this taxation. Remember that the state controls everything we can and can't do as a town, uh, which is frustrating sometimes, but the town's point is well taken. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For, uh, there's, and you ought to look at it from the point of view if you can present a good budget that right. is fiscally responsible, you are providing some tax relief to those people who deserve that kind of consideration. So that, that I, I would look at it in the sense of delivering a good budget. I'll, I'll use the delivery of tax relief. Right. So I am I am looking at it uh, more from a programmatic um, perspective. So as an example, one demographic, veterans. There are communities in Maine that, um, which I'm assuming it must be permissible across the board, who provide tax relief for veterans based it's upon certain qualifications. Well, so there, so not to get into the details of all of it, I'm just saying yeah, that we need to look okay. at it from a broader pers uh, broader perspective and, and uh, you know, periscope. So. There's a deduction right. on valuation. Just, I, I'd have better. a process question, because it, it, it strikes me that, you know, is that something that should be put into an ordinance committee, into 
a finance committee discussion, or is it? I mean, wh wh what's the best venue to take that up with? Because finance, we we didn't really discuss it all that much, but there was adjustments made this year through ordinance, I think, to, to the to the actual so I allocation. So the one town that I looked at, which was the town of Wells, that does a, a larger program, actually started in their ordinance committee and then the finance committee. It's kind of like you know, whenever you look at anything, you show it's kind of like the legislature, right? Mm -hmm. The legislature has physical notes on everything to determine is there a financial impact. Right. You know, whether we employ that same type of strategy, not necessarily to the you know to the extent that they do, probably is worthwhile looking at. So maybe this starts in ordinance and then goes to the finance committee to see what the financial impact would be because it has a budgetary. Can you, can you know, suggest aspect. language that would kind yeah. of broaden that so it's not so focused on seniors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me think about it. Um, I mean, I just said, you know, I just put tax relief yeah. programs for seniors and others in need yeah. or at risk. So we can define those later. I don't, I mean, this no, is no, kind of a broad fine. conversation. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. My comment on this is that I think it's implied here, but maybe we should be more explicit that it's really, it's, it's a means-based program, so it's not just. Not just, just because you're. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Well, our current program. Isn't oh, our current program is needs okay. based. Sure. I, not, not. To, and I won't mention his name. Just as an, as an example, I have a good dear friend who um, um, received Social Security income. He's a veteran. Um, his Social Security income is actually less than his total tax. The only thing he gets because he is a senior and then the income is he gets the six hundred dollars. He can't afford the rest of his taxes. Right. Because his social security income is like it's like four hundred bucks a month, and his taxes is far yeah. greater. Than yeah. So but I think there's different demographics right. that you can. But look I also at. think there's different ways to to approach that, I and mean, then we've kind of had pro peripheral discussions around yeah. that. With whether it's increasing the allotment based on means right. and and increasing it above that six hundred dollars to uh, as a means test, yes. or or if it's broadening the program as a whole to to give a little bit wait, wait. to everybody or something. That's but, what Wilt does. They defer, they, they, I call it deferring because they don't waive it. Right. For, right. You know, the program we do now, we give them the actual deduction, but, but they I'd defer like, it. Yeah. I'd like to see us pick this up in committee because yeah. I, mean, I think it's something that, that it's, it's worth a discussion around for sure, but I think it's a complex issue. And, you know, I'd like to see a committee, whichever one we decide, kind of take this up and start doing some homework on Saco it. Saco also, I think, has yes. something. Yeah. Finance yeah. want to take a shot at it. Ordinance? Ordinance, ordinance so, I think, should. So, without getting into those particulars, uh, for purpose of tonight, if we can broaden that to yeah. means based tax relief for seniors and others in need. Perfect. Sounds good. Yeah. And then, Sean, I, I tried to catch up uh, your suggestions on the first bullet, something along the lines. Just say, cr um, create a financial strategy that manages the town's fiscal health. Yes. I would, but I, I think. And what we've heard from constituents. However, that I think we I think around that long term financial modeling is something that needs to be worked out that too. Because I mean, it, oh. it, it is more, Chris, I get your point, but it's more important now that we've got a public safety building that's bringing on a debt service. Mm -hmm. And now that we're, you know, at least, you know, preliminary, a pretty significant investment in a primary school that's going to be debt service. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to start looking at the planning and how we do that, how do we, so I, I think however you, the financial modeling piece is, is what people have been asking us for. I would expect this bullet would be right in the wheelhouse of the Finance Committee and I think you have broad mandate okay. to right. do all sorts of things uh, that you think are appropriate under this fiscal uh, strategy or financial mm -hmm. strategy. Mm -hmm. And then before you leave it, the only other piece that I had is I think we've heard at least from a significant portion of how we do it. Maybe the tax increase below 3% is a good starting point, but I think there are certainly expectations in certain parts of the community that 3% may not be the right number anymore. And then how do we how do we look at that based on even the, the, the comment Sean brought up, that a lot of people on fixed incomes are not getting 3% increases. Um, so I, I think saying below 3% gives us some latitude, but, it, but I think we shouldn't just accept 3% as the number. Um, I think we need to really balance the needs of the community, choices of the community versus what they're willing to pay for. And that's going to be a really difficult conversation. Katie? Um, and I'm going to apologize up front because I'm definitely not 100% tonight, but um, I'm going to back up a little high again and go back to the first and just say I, like, I concur with all of those themes. I thought those were well captured. 
um, in terms of this particular piece. I agree with all four of those budgets, or all four of those bullets. Um, uh, in terms of bullet three, I, I would love to see us, uh, and I know it's met with resistance and it would be an extreme challenge, but I would love to see budget scenarios in which what does the 0% budget look like? What would be the services that we would lose in town? And I think when you can show people that, they then themselves would make, you know, if you started saying, guess what, you're now taking your garbage to the dump instead of having curbside pickup, you know, some of those things, there's, they get a lot more for their buck than they sometimes realize, and I think we need to find, and that, this kind of goes back to the first bullet, too, in terms of strategy. It's about showing people how to appreciate the value of the services that they are getting, and half of, half of the things that they're getting, they probably don't even realize. And, and I, I've always, I'm sorry to start up, I've always thought that we don't do a really good job of showing people what the same tool is attached. What, they, what are you getting from the taxes? So I think, you know, and so I, I'm fine with the low 3%, but I think the goal should always be, if you say 3%, then you're hitting 3%. I've always been taught, you know, whether I was playing sports or <coughs> whatever goal I was at, you know, make the goal bigger because you might just hit it. <laughs> you know, make it make it a stretch goal for you. Um, so I'd be happy seeing, you know, 1%. I would love that. Um, and then someone mentioned, I can't remember, cold head. Uh, again, going back to the trust issue, um, we have to just continue to, to keep at it, keep whittling away and doing everything. And I think uh, from what I saw at the Listen to Learn session yesterday, I, it was a great turnout. It looked to be a great dialogue. I had to leave a little early. Um, but we are trying some things different this year, and I think that's a good thing. I think we have to be listening. And if folks are really adamant that they would like us to still do the forum, maybe we still do the forum. Or maybe we do a version of the forum. I and mean, I know that's not our sole decision to make. It would have to be something that the Finance Committee would work with the school board on. But, um, you know, let's let's try to be really listening uh, as we learned at our session. So I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that... Uh, Getting below three uh, is always a challenge. I've looked at the data of going back 20 years, and and it's it's closer to four. Long before any of us ever sat in these chairs, so there's a long history of uh, so what we sh are striving for in recent years with let's see if we can stay below three is an achievement. Uh, if you just look at the five years preceding, six years preceding the four that we many of us have had an influence on the budget, which is below three, it's it's more like four. Uh, I think we're reaching. I think yeah. we're seeing in the last couple of years we're reaching that point where people are unwilling to sustain that level, and that we just need to be aware of that. So just right. because it's always been that way. Well, but, 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 but we've done a good job in getting below, uh, down to 2.9 over the last four years, yeah. which there's no other period of time where that sustained uh, level that was, has been achieved. No, and what, what you see always is when you go really low is that it's followed by a number of years yeah. where you end up really high. A rebound. Yeah, you always get a rebound. Yeah. So we I, I, why, I, we don't need to convince, oh, yeah. okay. we we need need to convince <laughs> everybody out there that yeah. comes to the poll that okay. they so, need to buy into perhaps yeah. Perhaps it's nuanced, but the way that's stated below 3% is right. more exact and better than it's been over the yeah, last three right. cycles. As we said, the language around. was to less than or around. Yeah. Yes. And so I, I, you're, well, you are flexibility. Right. flexibility, but you're also holding yourself to a higher target. So I guess, I mean, I, I'd be willing to support a lower number, but I'd want to see some thought behind it and some metrics behind it and some, some analysis behind it, right? So I, I think the, and that was kind of trying to my point before, the 3% isn't an arbitrary number. It's based on historical information and data driven. So if someone asks us, where did you come up with that? It right, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't just where well, we feel like this is a good right. number. No, 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 just, no. Yeah, both should be aspirational, but you, right. you shouldn't set yourself up for failure. I mean, right. don't set a goal that you can't 
reasonably attained. Right. right. But, but to Peter's point, I mean, you're right. I mean, they do need to be, if they need to be adjusted, <laughs> then let's put some metrics behind it, let's put some data behind it, and, and if 3% isn't the right number and we want to explore that, let's figure out what, what metrics are behind there that we can show and justify that, yeah, you're right, maybe it's, maybe it is cost of living or something like that. And, 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 and again, I guess Tom's for that, maybe some of the finance committee can, right. I mean, yep. we're, yep. below 3% gives us Latitude. Latitude. Well, and, good work. and I just want to clarify, like, if, you know, my suggestion around a zero percent, what a zero percent looks like, it's really it's not about, like, that's necessarily the budget I think we should adopt or the direction we should go. It's more about showing people what it would, what, how it would hurt. And I appreciate that, but the, and at the end, we'd be making the decisions on what would be cut, and, and it kind of falls back to me, like the Higgins Beach, or the Pine Point cleaning decision, where we thought, and we voted unanimously that, yes, we thought that that could come out, and, you know, we got a lot of backlash, and, a lot, and rightfully so, but there was a lot more, more pushback on that particular issue than we had anticipated. So I, I, I don't say that that's not, a, that's not a bad approach to look at as a scenario, but we'd still have to make some kind of projections or some kind of decisions on what to cut, and that in and of itself could be volatile and, and create controversy in the community. I think you'll see that thought on the next Agreed. one. Yes. Cast a little more positively than, than right. negatively. So. Yeah. I'll point out again, that we're, we're talking about a budget. We don't know about tax rate until we get the valuation back much later. So it's Again, it's a squirrely number. So maybe <laughs> before we move off this, uh, Sean, express some concern about the final bullet. I'm fine. Budget uh, consensus. All right, I will recast these first two in terms of symbolism. Community relations. Build trust. Making more public, including more real dialogue. Help public offer their input in respectful ways. Yeah. Involved and engaged community and more budget, yeah. more in budget than other issues. So there's great understanding of how money is spent and the value of services. Yeah. So that rather than hitting over the head with what we're, you know, what a drastic, uh, drastically reduced budget is, educate them on the value of what's in there. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, as as chair of communications, um, I I read these and, and they sound really nice, but they aren't helpful as far as goals because it's like, so how do you know when you built trust? What does that mean? Um, what's more, what the heck does real dialogue mean? Um, helping public offer input in respectful ways. I mean, these are aspirational as opposed to whatever, but don't give clear guidance is how I felt reading these. I mean, they, they sound wonderful. They're great. That, now, that bullet four, actually, I was one who talked about that when I talked to uh, John and Dana, um, and I'm assuming Katie probably brought it up too, and perhaps some of the others. Um, that's definitely something that could be, you know, how how do you how are you going to do that? Um, but anyway, that was just how I thought. I think they're great aspirational, but it's not. It's like, okay, so what more can we do that we haven't been doing? Well, for instance, there was a conversation at the <laughs> retreat, um, and we've already begun some of it actually. In terms of real dialogue, um, our listening sessions, they rather than listening, it's more of this give and take of information. So I think. Right. I feel as though we're starting to advance that, and there's other strategies that we could look at. There's also, I think, some willingness, it sounds like, to be a little more lean with folks at the podium as time and That's circumstance right. permits. Mm -hmm. Those will be things that, yeah. if you're mindful of this being your goal, you'll find ways to engage. Well, I know, but I, that's just the only thing. I thought they were very broad and very non toolsy Well, I'm going to turn it back on you then. I know, and I know, and it's like... I haven't had a chance to really think that through. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, there certainly is consensus I'm hearing on the theme itself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Area of focus. I, I think maybe to Jean Marie's point is, is how to, so let's, let's look at these with eye towards quantifying them. What, if we're going to say build trust with the constituents, let's have a goal. What does that look like? What is the outcome well, of that? Establish more and more listening sessions. Uh, uh, yeah. is, it, is it fewer email? I mean, there's got to be a, some kind of tangible measurement that we can show success with. Whatever it is, I mean, a survey beginning the year end of year. Survey, uh, yeah, uh, identify, you know, critique what we have for.
services that gets the message out. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we didn't have a Facebook page, if we didn't have uh, a website, you could easily say, well, this is easy to measure. You don't have this and this and this. These are standard items for being able to effectively communicate right. with your constituents. So I think that is something. Uh, if the communications committee is going to do its job of evaluating, overseeing right. high level uh, and saying what are we missing where how can we do the things that we're doing better uh, and that that uh, a report back to us because that is part of the charge of the community right. let's let's get that report uh, uh, out and, and, it, and it could be that uh, this is something that okay the communications committee because I know our next meeting what we're going to be talking about is what is our goal because it was kind of loosey-goosey whatever in my opinion from last year so setting mm -hmm. a goal and specific types of actions so I think that, that I could use I can use this overall overarching themes to others I think we're saying we're going to throw it to the communication <laughs> yes, to, to, yep. to do a job of critiquing and recommending actions that will control I'm not hearing any opposition on the not on this one, but really finding ways to do it. Yeah, find ways to get it, yeah. And I think it's the only thing I'd add, too, is that the number one to me on that, what really leaps off and just in the broadest text is just how do we build trust? I mean, that, that's that's what we've heard of here. Mm -hmm. So all the other things are kind of tools. To yeah, it, I mean, to me, trust. The, the, the trust factor is how do you present a really good, credible budget? fiscally responsible budget right. because if you said where's the trust thing coming from it, it comes from the uh, 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 school budget that's where that's where that's the largest contentious point well, I, I would say that's our perception of it for sure because that's what we feel like we put the most maybe, emphasis into it maybe but I right. think part of those listening structures might be you know a simple follow-up of you know you're, if someone says we don't trust you the question is why why right. yeah. why is that's it because right. we right. say things like you know you're not debating enough in right. in, 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 in chin that's something that we always right. felt like sure. seven enough in votes are the way to debate <laughs> consensus and have everybody just yeah. do right. and it was the opposite you know so right. you're right I, 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 mean, I think the focus on budgets is natural, right? It's a tangible sure. validation or not of what you're doing. Well, that's the one opportunity where the public can weigh in on a vote. And that's that's where we, I think, oh, that's the budget side. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So we'll okay. move on to the uh, planning and comprehensive plan. So, three thoughts here adopt the quality comprehensive plan. It's going to happen within this next calendar year. Mm -hmm. So, your watch. Work with Carver Downs developers to make sure their plan is good for the town. Mm -hmm. That's a process that's underway. In fact, there's a workshop scheduled in two weeks or your next meeting, I should say. Mm -hmm. And continue to work on increasing affordable housing. I'm, I'm good. Okay. We'll thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, my apologies for keeping yeah. <laughs> out of turn. Uh, I know. Uh, so um, I'd love to see a, a couple other just points of emphasis included in there if we could it's a, um, specifically environmental resiliency and historic preservation if we're mm -hmm. can any of those fall under the, the comprehensive plan and the reason I say that is because it's I, a think work they, I think they should all be addressed in the comprehensive plan absolutely right. I'd love to see them called right. out ex explicitly as town council goals mm -hmm. or, or points of emphasis that the town council is endorsing can you be more specific about Like environmental yeah. means, I mean, could mean anything. Uh, so from environmental resiliency, I'm specifically thinking of sea level rise. But of what? Sea level rise. Oh, okay, okay. Well, then you have yeah. the Conservation Committee is doing some really good work around that. So yeah. Yeah. a lot of that's yeah. underway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think just, just including it in our goals is being supportive of the efforts that they're going to do. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I, one of my themes with the, with the, and I don't even think it, I don't know if it's up here or not, but one of my themes with the consultants was I think we, you know, we, we do need to put a lot of, of um, work back into tasking the, the boards and committees that we have. Yeah. You know, and, and giving them a little bit more direction maybe. I mean, I think the comprehensive plan is a great opportunity to kind of pull us all together and, and have a common goal and then all contribute to it. But, but I think to your point on environmental, if, 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 uh, 
conservation is looking at that. There's no reason why we as a committee can't, as a council can't say, we would like to task the conservation committee right. with looking at this and coming, looking at surrounding communities, what are they doing, give us an update. Give, give, them, give them, task them to do some homework and some research for us if it rises to the level of... And they spend... I'm jumping ahead. Yep. The first one is the line more the work on committees, so that's that. Yeah. Katie, yeah. yeah. okay, how um, so usually I go really high level first, but I'm just going to throw out a gritty detail, and I'm not sure where it fits, if it's under this particular theme or not. But one of the things I've thought a lot about was, uh, you know, I, a few of you have said how quickly a term can go, and yeah. think about, uh, you know, being really one of the big things that you would hope to accomplish while you were serving. And one of the things that I would love to see us find a way to do somewhere, somehow, is incentivizing building for um, developers to do another 55, more 55 plus communities. We've talked about it. It's been thrown out there in the conference of planning discussions, but um, it's the type of housing we need um, for sure. We know that, and uh, it also uh, helps the tax issue. So it's a it's a, it's a win win as far as I'm concerned. I just am not sure how to go about it or where it fits best. I'm not sure what barriers we have in place, but uh, that's not to say we couldn't create some incentives. Well, I, the, the big barrier that I, my but conversations with developers is that simply, that's great, Katie, but it costs me more to do that than it does to build uh, a four to five hundred thousand dollar colonial, so I'm going to make more money off of there. So if there's an incentive to build that community, that type of housing, you know, then maybe we can get someone to buy into that. Those are the same arguments I hear from developers too when I'm I'm begging them, can you please do something? <laughs> so so again, I, 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 I laudable goals I think, but I'd like to see some metrics behind it. I'd like to see some demographics in town of what percentage of population we're at now. And because I think affordable housing falls into that gap too. And I, I don't know if affordable housing incentivizes more opportunity um, to 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 cover a broader sense of people versus 55 and older. And I'm not distinguishing, <laughs> trying to discriminate against 55 and older. I just, I would like to see some, mm -hmm. some demographics and some thought and, and, and processing behind making those goals. Because I, I agree, that could be, that could be you know, it, it could come out that that's a growing segment of the population and, and that's something that we want to address, for sure. If I can add just one piece, I think they're perfectly stated to some extent. The number two, though, is that and, you know, unless they come back, unless Discover Downs, the owners of Discover Downs comes and asks for a contract zone, you know, I hope, I would rather see this language suggest that we work with the planning board to ensure that the Discover Downs development is suitable for the town or is, you know, because it's really the planning board's job to do that. Um, but the uniqueness about the zone is they have to come up with a master plan and we have to approve it as a council for us. So that's the uniqueness True. of this property. Right, so since the, the next one is about um, operations and it talks about using committees, the planning board is a committee of the town and I think that we need to partner with them as part of this, mm -hmm. no matter what the process mm -hmm. is in the long run. Because um, they're the experts, we're not the experts. I don't know exactly when and what they'll be, but I'm almost certain that they'll be coming to you for some sort of change, whether it's yeah. zoning relief for changes or Connectivity. I mean, the, the council will be involved in the next year. And, and when I looked at the, the first two, I said, "We've got a comprehensive plan, probably a month to six weeks away. We've got uh, a uh, master plan for Scarborough Downs, probably a couple months away, a, mm -hmm. a, a full-blown master plan. Uh, we had to, uh, and I'd like to see the town manager give us." some real guidance on uh, to work with uh, uh, the comprehensive plan people, which would be the planning department, the, uh, uh, code enforcement, uh, town engineer. We need to get right into that. And so workshops relative to having those elements presented to us uh, and where the policy issues are, uh, that that would be really rolling our sleeves up, I think, to be able to, if we're going to do a quality conference of plan, we got to work at it. So, and I think long range planning is, has been the mm -hmm. kind of the central hub for, for that planning process, and I know they are interested in coming back in front of us very, very shortly and giving a presentation on where they're at and, and, Good. and mm -hmm. the process. 
Any reaction to the suggestion as well? Talked about the environmental resiliency and historic preservation is being called up separately. With the uh, environmental is huge, a huge issue. I mean that this community sits on the ocean, so I mean that that is a big deal. Uh, historic preservation uh, that ha they've done a pretty good job uh, of actively advancing that that whole situation, uh, and we all know that. Uh, our former town council chair has been very active in advancing that. So whether it, I don't know whether that would mean the environmental, yes, the historic preservation, no. This town benefits from an active effort at historic preservation because it, it doesn't have a huge history of it. Backlog. I would say I wouldn't mind including them, but I'd like to see some specific goals in there of what that would look like, like historic preservation, if it's if it's if it's saving a couple of buildings or if there's specific properties that we had in mind, or if there's more, you know, community education around that or community involvement around something that's tangible that we can that we can So I, I think that there are specific properties, but some of it right. is also just opportunistic. Um, yep. when when some of the properties that sure. are on the list become threatened. Um, that um, but um, but my thought was really just Kind of continue the third bullet point with a couple of comments. Oh, a string of things kind of continue the effort. Um, yeah. Affordable yeah. housing, environmental yeah. resiliency, and historic yeah. preservation. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate once you have yeah. these kind of lofty goals, you push them out to the committee and right. report right. back to us. Right. Why can you help us advance this? I think the metrics will probably come from the committee. They're down in the trenches. And, and to Katie's point about 55 plus housing, we we heard a lot of uh, questions at the last listening session uh, earlier this week about how can you expand that tax base right. uh, and, and without uh, suffering any dramatic increase in municipal or school services. And 55 plus housing is one way. And we had a workshop last year with a developer uh, who wanted to do 55 plus housing on a major scale. Uh, but he needed sewer, and we don't have sewer west of the highway. So there's there's a, there's an impediment there. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking this kind of housing, you're talking a fairly compressed uh, area. So can we work with developers? Uh, how we how we go about actually uh, and, and drawing people uh, with interest? I'm not sure, but I'd be interested. I think it is a, it's a way to grow our tax base without growing the expense side. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there a general agreement that we can look here? Sure. We're past seven, so we're going to move quickly. This is real quick. Seniors, you only thought that we are here with more federal, more senior friends. Yeah, and as the uh, liaison to the seniors group, um, I do know that's one of their goals work on the AARP friendly uh, town designation. So again, that's something that can go back to that committee. We've already talked about it. Just as a fun fact, AARP just put something out that said that Maine has the most AARP friendly cities and towns of any state in the United States right now. So <laughs> I forget how many there are, but that is something that... Well, that'd be a good metric. Think, yeah. A uh, good benchmark. Yeah, and there is a definite metric so or whatever. So there's a lot of goal that you want to maintain. Yeah. This is one that I wondered whether it was actually a goal or just something to remind me of. So all of this theme of special operations rely more heavily on city work. Some that are organized for continuity year to year. Spend less time on small impact issues, more big picture, more mutual support for decisions once they're made, consensus, be able to disagree with respect mm -hmm. all views heard, and all should feel building participated in deliberations. Everyone included in all communication. Does that sound like a goal to you? Or is it just kind of sounds like norm norm yeah, uh, sounds like norm norm norms practices yeah. Yeah. those sorts of things yeah. things that you can check in on uh, some frequency yeah. or yeah. 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 so maybe this doesn't rise to the level of a council right. goal right. yeah I I don't think it does yeah. but they're good rules to live by.
No, I, I agree with Norms. I guess in the only thing I'm going to conclude with as, as we come through this, it's an awful lot of goals. <laughs> yeah, I, just, yeah. I really believe in the keep it simple principle, and I, I, I still hear Sean, what we haven't done tonight, which I think we do need to do, if we're going to have all these goals, we got to have some metrics that we can, you know, a year from now say we either were successful or not. It gets to your point, some of them are pretty vague. So I think on the finance side, some of those, the finance committee can take a look at it, try to come up with some goals. But I don't think we've got time tonight. But at, but at some point, I think. And we what I would like to do is is have it get uh, have it rewritten. Put uh, uh, some assignments out to finance, others out to communications or other uh, assignments, so if uh, so that we can have a little bit clearer sense of are we successful this year or are we not? Well, uh, my intention was to I'll put the rework that hopefully capture these thoughts. I'll send it out in advance and tell me if I if I miss something. Uh, and have it on your next agenda to have it adopted. I think having the council actually yeah. adopt it is important. Uh, then we can ship it out to committees right. and say these are the goals. How do you want what, what's your contribution here? And how do we have them for that help, <laughs> the tangible results? And, and I would suggest asking the committees uh, to report back with an X amount of time on what they've done for the work in Good. Okay. Good. Council meeting of Wednesday, January 17, 2018. We're 709, so we're a little late. We just had a, a workshop on goals 
Uh, we're going to be discussing that again at the next meeting uh, as we try and revamp it and then uh, approve it. Um, so, call to order. Uh, if you'd uh, rise with me and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Councilor Bayvine? Present. Councilor Bowen? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Dunham? Here. Uh, general public comments. Anyone wishing to address any issue uh, not on tonight's agenda, please uh, approach the podium. And Mr. Howard has a slide, I think. Yep, I just have a couple of quick slides here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Benjamin Howard, uh, Seven Winter Pine. Um, as I've begun preparing myself for uh, the budget discussion this year, I've downloaded all of the uh, available budgets online and put them into an Excel and started to do some data analysis myself. Uh, but that's not what I'm really here to talk about tonight. It's just an idea for changing how we get the information to the public in a way that I think could answer a lot of the problems that were discussed in, in the goals meeting tonight. So currently, this is sort of how the line-by-line -line items, and this is the section that I'm looking at right here. You look at it, and it's just a wall of text. And you look through, and you, as the president of the town, you just look through, and you go, oh my goodness, what the hell does any of this mean? Excuse my language there. I'm sorry. Um, but you go through, and you see numbers that are for example, just below the arrows there, percentage increase of 198.2% increase. And though that's where people start to freak out. But in no place do we have all this document data um, stored for all the previous years. So here I'm just going to call out um, the middle school teacher benefits as the data itself sort of uh, looks the best. A lot of the other data doesn't look this nice to bring the point home, but um, so the idea here is that you would have a link that would just be attached to that line right there. And you click on that link, and when you clicked on that link, you would see this information here. Um, right here, you see the graph right there of just the data from the teacher benefits at the middle school from 2011 all the way up to 2017, which is what I have the data in there for right now. You notice um, the budget that I showed you there was the 2016-2017 budget data. That 12% increase is that little, that dip right back up to what looks like uh, matched the previous trend. Now, as someone that's looking at that budget and sees the 12%, when I click on this, I go, oh, it kind of makes sense now, right? We had a dip. It does bring up the question why we had the dip, but we're not really debating that in the present year. You're debating where things are going. But that dip sort of makes sense, and it allows me, myself, to answer the question. Um, to the side here are the exact numbers that you're seeing um, on the left. Um, also available, I would also like to just put all the schools there for comparison, and citizens could turn them on and off. The idea here is just a concept. Um, it's just a lot of work with Excel. Uh, I've been doing myself graphing all this data. It's very time consuming, uh, but you can use Visual Basic and such things to speed it up. But I really just wanted to collect the data right now. I'm not a guru with Visual Basic, um, but I'd like to get there. But first, I'd like to have the data for this year's discussions. Um, but the idea would just be able to give the citizens more information just by clicking it. So that instead of reaching out to you and questioning why, why is it 200%? And to note that 200% for the, uh, the uh, ed tech but, uh, benefit also jumps back up, and it's just matching this sort of same trend that we see here. But it starts to answer those questions. And again, it also gives you trends and see where things are coming from. So um, this is just an idea. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, but uh, if you could reach out to me at some point, it would be greatly appreciated. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Uh, I uh, appreciate all the effort that you put into that uh, because it's obviously uh, uh, trying to make an effort at having it be more understandable to the public. And uh, I'm sure the town manager is interested in, in looking at it and the financial people and 
probably be able to give you uh, a little feedback on that. Thank you. Anyone else uh, uh, like to speak? Ed Blanchard, 146 Payne Road. Um, it may have been brought up at other council meetings, I don't know, but uh, it, going down uh, towards Pine Point from Route 1, there was a speed limit, uh, like a solar speed limit sign. So when you went from the 45, you transitioned into the 35, and it would come on if you were going over 35. I think I think that it's gone now for some reason. I don't know if it got like tossed to another part of town or something. I don't know, but you know, I, I go down that road, you know, a lot because I did plans for a living, so I'm headed down that road, and it's always like a, a good reminder. I mean, plus you're headed into the school school area. Mm -hmm. I just think that they probably would be, you know, I think it would be a good thing to have around town. I don't know if it, if it got moved because it was bothering neighbors in the area or something. I don't know, but, but I thought it was a good tool. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the town manager to uh, provide a little insight on that. Yes, the council may recall, I believe last summer, a resident of Pine Point actually donated a, this, this sign. It's portable. Um, his request is during the summer months that it be in Pine Point proper, but encouraged us to move it around, and that's what we've done. So we've moved it to other places. Our history and Others suggest that, frankly, the longer you leave those up in a fixed location, people start to ignore them. So actually switching up location, and I expect you'll see that back in some sort of rotation basis. Uh, we find them to be far more effective and kind of jarring to your senses when you don't expect it there. Uh, if it's there every day, I dare say you might not even notice it going down. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to address the council? No public comment. Include uh, minutes of December 19, and well, let's deal with those of uh, 19th and 20th, uh, 2017. The special town council meeting and a regular town council meeting. Uh, I have a motion. So, move, move approval. Uh, any comments, questions on either? Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Adjustments to the agenda: none. At the moment, uh, items to be signed. I've signed the treasurer's warrants, uh, and we'll now address uh, old business. Order number 17-109, act on the request for the Scarborough Town Council to order the discontinuance of all portions of Avenue 2 located southerly of King Street with no damages awarded to the abutting landowners and to file said order with the town clerk and to send abutting property owners notice of this action and schedule the public hearing for Wednesday, February 7, 2018, and Wednesday, February 21, 2018. This has been tabled from the December 6, 2017 uh, meeting. And uh, I will say uh, we've made some real progress in the discussions that have been going on between the interested parties uh, 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 for Avenue 2. Uh, this council, I think, is is uh, completely in support of maintaining the public access. Uh, I can say that unconditionally. Uh, uh, and uh, at this point, I think a few more weeks are needed to be able to get that final agreement. A lot of progress was made in the interim between the time this was tabled last. Uh, and the expectation is that we are going to be able to reach an agreement that is satisfactory. Uh, I'd like to be able to let anyone who's in the audience uh, still who's braved it to come out this evening uh, to speak to this issue. Uh, if you wish to, please approach the podium before we uh, would entertain a motion to table it to February 7th. Seeing none, uh, we have, uh, uh, and before I uh, entertain a motion to table, uh, I would ask uh, whether the council has any thoughts on the fact that we have reached this what appears to be a successful point and we had uh, some time ago, months ago scheduled two public hearings uh, whether uh, you want to give that some thought we will be able to 
make a determination on February 7th when it comes back on our agenda, whether we want to hold public, two public hearings or whether one would suffice because we would have a public hearing in advance of the February 7th meeting and then a independent public hearing and right now we are scheduled to have two of those. I don't want to ask members of the public who have a strong interest in having to repeatedly come out. It's just really in deference to uh, people who have had a strong interest, uh, but we are heading in the right direction. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. Chris? Well, I, I think we should just see what happens on February 7th, and if we have a large turnout and people want to continue that approach, that's, I'd be happy extending that. Um, if not, if nobody shows up on the 7th, I don't know we, we can address it then. Um, but if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on, on what the delay is. Yeah. I believe it's because of... Um, the delay is caused by the fact that the Gables Condominium Association uh, needs to hold another vote. And, and that's going to take, uh, uh, that will occur between now and February 7th. Uh, and at that point, we will have agreement uh, so as to be able to move this forward in a very successful way. Other comments? I'll accept a motion to table. Jean Marie. Uh, I move that we table order number 17-109 to a date specific, February 7th, to give the opportunity for the Gables, <laughs> Gables Condo Association to take their final vote. Second. Second. Discussion. There's no discussion. Just see if you were keeping awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all in favor. Thank you. New business, order number 18-001. Uh, 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 move approval of uh, the first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to the Higgins Beach character-based zoning districts and schedule a public hearing upon receipt of the recommendations of the planning board I will note that there is a second uh, order that immediately follows. We're going to ask Jay Chase, the planning director, to uh, uh, address and take questions on both uh, uh, so that just for efficiency we'll get Jay up once and try and uh, deal with that. The second item is order 18002, uh, first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough zoning map. Uh, thank you, Jay. All yours. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay Chase, Planning Director here in town. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, before you are two recommendations that are coming from the Long Range Planning Committee that are really being generated as part of the Higgins Beach uh, Character Code Audit that we conducted back in the spring through the summer and culminated in the adoption of a suite of changes to the character code uh, in September of this year. As most uh, council members will recall, and I believe Jean Marie, you may even recall because I believe you were on the committee when <laughs> it was adopted, uh, the character code was adopted back in December of uh, 2015. <clears throat> it being a very different type of zoning ordinance than our standard <coughs> Um, or, so we really want to take a look at, you know, after we're a year, year and a half in, how things were working. What did we get right? What needed some adjustments? And so, as I said, that was a process we worked through in the spring and summer through uh, neighborhood meetings and discussions with Long Range Planning Committee that culminated in those changes in September. So, really, there's two two things, and the first one I'm going to touch on actually isn't in, uh, in reference to the map. It has to do with clarification of language particularly around non-conforming uh, structures. One of the issues that was identified back uh, through that audit process was that any existing non-conforming structures within the Higgins Beach Code area, if anyone wants to make any adjustments, modifications, additions to, their prop to those properties, even if they were going to be, even if those uh, improvements were in conformance with the zoning, the way the language was written, they, that couldn't be done without bringing the entire house, the entire structure into conformance with the zoning. 
or going to the Court of Appeals for a, a variance. Well, after discussion, that didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, particularly if people want to do things that would be otherwise conforming with the character code. We need some modifications to uh, Article 5C of the zoning ordinance, which allowed existing non-conforming structures to, other, to make improvements that would otherwise be conforming. However, one of the things we, that was added um, was language that was both um, in some ways redundant and in, 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 in particular uh, uh, in conflict with existing zone, zoning language, um, particularly around what you can do with non-conforming structures that are otherwise damaged or destroyed and the ability to rebuild those in a certain time frame. The shoreland zoning provisions, which apply to quite a number of properties in Higgins Beach, which are state mandated, have a certain set of regulations, which largely uh, mirror what our underlying zoning ordinance says, and that applies to every property in town. When we adopted the Higgins Beach changes, suite of changes in, uh, in September, we actually created some language with, that was more restrictive, uh, as I said, a bit redundant, but more problematic, more restrictive than any other zone in the town. So uh, someone who has a property in the rural farming parts of town or those who have in other beach communities like Pine Point or Prouts Neck um, had <coughs> more ability to rebuild their homes should they be destroyed for means outside of the owner's control, be that a fire, uh, uh, a flood, what have you, an act of God, so to speak. So the proposal would be to sh simply strike language under Article 5, C2.H. Um, we've looked at the language. We believe we have uh, lang uh, existing language in both the zo uh, standard zoning ordinance and the shoreland zone zoning ordinance that covers those issues. Um, we've talked about this with the Long Range Planning Committee, um, and they uh, saw fit to put forward the proposal to strike that language. So that's the first order that's in front of you. Um, and do you want me to just jump right into the mapping? Please, would you? Questions? Happy to. Thank you. Uh, so I think the bigger component piece to this uh, uh, changes that came out of the, the audit process uh, has to do with the actual mapping itself. This was an item that was actually brought to us at the public open house uh, by residents in the Higgins Beach area, really identifying that, um, you know, there's a difference in the properties between Spurwink Road uh, and, and Kelly Lane, uh, that those properties are really different and distinct from the overall uh, sort of Oceanside neighborhood. That the properties are unique in that they, there are different development patterns consisting of larger lots, largely more suburban style development, houses a bit set back from the road, this being sort of the main conduit corridor into the neighborhood where once you get beyond uh, Kelly Lane and, and down uh, into Greenwood and such, traffic tends to diffuse a bit more with all the interconnected roads. Um, there's also one of the other uh, big differences with these properties is that they aren't on public sewer. They are, um, don't have the ability to connect in based on the type of lines that are in the area. And so that really hinders what they can do and where houses can be set on the property since they need to have on-site septic systems. So based on the feedback we received at the open house, we did an analysis of the, I believe it's 16 properties, developed properties, and sort of looked at what are the prevailing development patterns. What we found was that really, you know, one of the goals of the Higgins Beach uh, character code was to align the zoning with the prevailing development <coughs> in the area. And by and large, we felt like that was generally uh, well received, sort of on the ocean side of things. but sort of missed the mark, if you will, uh, in this sort of gateway stretch. Um, and so after some further discussion with the committee, with the residents, the, um, the prevailing consideration is to revert the zoning back uh, for these properties back to the R4 zone, which they were prior to the 2000, December 2015 adoption of the Higgins Beach zone. Um, and so that's really a map amendment. Um, staff working with the Long Range Planning Committee. We sent letters to all the um, affected property owners. We received um, five responses back, um, all generally favorable. One person did request consideration to enabling one year 
we'll have a transition period in which both zones might apply, <laughs> where people can figure out what they want to move forward with. Um, that came in uh, uh, late uh, or earlier today. Um, and then I believe council members also all received a letter from Ms. Bristol who lives down on uh, Bayview Avenue um, and she had some questions regarding uh, uh, the Higgins Beach Marketplace property. Um, but uh, I think with that I've given you uh, quite a bit to think about and here to answer any questions as they may Thank come you, up. Jay. Any questions? Uh, Will? Um, so you started off by uh, discussing what I thought were um, changes that would allow improvements to non-conforming um, structures um, without having to go through administrative. Um, but I, is that something that is coming in the future? Because I didn't see that in yeah. there. So, okay. so that, that was actually what was adopted in September. So, ah, okay. so in September we adopted, let me see, language under Article 5C2 is 2. That was the, all the new language and we had A through H. H was sort of the last subsection and it was H where um, we sort of as staff reviewed it and talked with long range, felt we might have stepped um, outside the lines a little bit unnecessarily and I think this is a good course correction to just delete that language, so. Great, thank you. And then I, I was wondering, um, could you provide any color to the letter that we received about the CMU zone? Sure. Um, let's see, so this is an issue that the Long Range Planning Committee talked quite a bit about. Um, so uh, the, the concern that's been raised, and, and I don't, I'll do my best to speak for Ms. Bristol, but, you know, again, um, uh, hopefully I've captured correctly. Uh, her, uh, she, one of her concerns has been the uh, ability for the four properties that are in the uh, coastal mixed-use districts, um, and that being the Marketplace, uh, the Higgins Beach Inn, the Higgins Beach Association Clubhouse, and the Breakers. And what that zone, that district allows is for basically those four uses to exist and then those properties could change use. Her concern has been the ability for those properties to change use, maybe at one that's now a bed and breakfast or an inn to be able to change to a, a retail use. Um, that's something that was actually looked at with the initial adoption and one of the provisions that in the language currently it says any, any change of use requires going back to the planning board for a full site plan review, sort of look at those impacts. Um, so certainly uh, the Long Range Planning Committee heard Ms. Bristol's concerns um, and, and debated those. I think um, uh, uh, Mr. Dunbin and Mr. Chiazzo speak to that. There was a pretty healthy discussion around that issue, but ultimately decided to move forward with, the, with what you have before you. Thank you. Other questions for Jay? Thank you, Jay. Uh, we'll take up the first, order number 1801. Uh, uh, motion, uh, first reading, refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to the Higgins Beach character based zoning districts. And this is the language relative to uh, uh, rebuilding after uh, damage of more than 50% of the building. So uh, uh, Oh. Uh, anyone in the public who would like to be able to speak to this issue? None. I'll uh, accept a motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion. Chris. Yeah, I, both of these issues were pretty well debated in long range planning, <coughs> um, pretty healthily <coughs> discussed um, and vetted fairly well. And I, I'm pretty sure there were unanimous decisions across the board for, for long range planning. So. Um, very comfortable putting the recommendations forward, well thought out, well, well debated, well documented, and well discussed. Great. Um, I know, as Jay mentioned, I wasn't on long range planning last year, but prior to, again, there was a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, work done on this whole concept uh, in that area. Um, and I think it's great that, you know, you see the reviews said, oh, this isn't working, this is. Again, um, knowing how long-range planning works, I feel extremely comfortable as a counselor that if they vetted this, uh, then it sh I will approve it, so. Other comments? Uh, I will say I, I, I really uh, admire the perseverance uh, of the planning department here because what they've been trying to do is get it right. 
uh, and if they see one aspect or another that isn't quite right, because this is very unusual zoning, and none of us have really ever had much uh, involvement with character-based zoning before. So uh, I really uh, have a great deal of respect for their willingness to stick with it uh, and come back uh, these several times now to get it as, uh, as good as it can be. Any further comments? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the second uh, uh, item is 18002, first reading, and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to the town of Scarborough zoning map. Anyone <laughs> in the public who would like to be able to address this, please approach the podium. None. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Chris. <coughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to expound a little bit on Councillor Rowan's question about the, the letter that came in. Um, the, the, the woman did present her argument to, to Long Range Planning, and, and um, it was it was very, again, very intently debated. I think at the end of the day, with the additional requirements of going in front of planning board, coupled with the fact that um, removing that ability for some of the, the CMUs could be restrictive or, or detrimental to those businesses in particular, um, we felt that there were sufficient um, checks, if you will, in the process in the system to allow that to move forward and we were comfortable making that decision moving forward. So, so I think that the issue, the, the concern was heard, um, it was well debated, addressed, and ultimately I think the decision was that there's, there's enough checks in the system now to, to um, help mitigate any situations that might arise. Other comments? <coughs> and, uh, again, this is uh, uh, a matter of inadvertence where we were trying to make all of Higgins Beach conforming, and a great deal of effort was put to it. But this little stretch as we uh, enter Higgins Beach was developed uh, a, a great deal uh, later. Had always been R4 when those structures were built, and so it fits more comfortably into an R4 setting uh, than a Higgins Beach character. So, any further comments? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order number 18003, first reading, and refer to the planning board the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section Roman Numeral 7C, Residential Density and Affordable Housing Provisions, Subsection B, Affordable Housing in Lieu Fee. And I'll ask Councilor Roman <coughs> to introduce this. Thank you. Um, so, um, as uh, you may recall, the um, Affordable Scarborough Housing Alliance has been um, uh, working on um, comprising a uh, RFP um, that they'd like to put out um, to encourage um, projects to be submitted um, to build affordable housing in, in the town. Um, and as we were putting that together, um, we referred back to this section of um, the zoning ordinance uh, that specified what the in lieu fees can be used for um, because we were we have some funds that we're um, suggesting could be used um, which is the intent of that RFP um, and uh, as we were doing that we noticed that um, it, it stipulates some of the things that that it can and can't be used for um, and um, it was observed that um, one of it does not explicitly prohibit the use of those in lieu fees to be used to build um, uh, houses inside an, uh, a zone in town where affordable housing may be required in order to develop those properties at all. And so the, the thought was that um, the onus was on that developer to build um, the affordable units um, in those zones under certain conditions and therefore that it, it wouldn't be appropriate for those um, in lieu fees that were collected with the intent of uh, producing additional affordable housing to be used um, um, in the construction of, of those units. Um, and so this is just an addition to say that, that in an inclusionary zone, um, the in lieu fee may not be used um, it to, in order to, uh, at least to meet the obligation that the developer <coughs> is under to, in order to develop that property. Thank you. Uh, anyone in the public would like to address this uh, proposed order? Please approach the podium. 
Hearing none, I uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Pretty pretty straightforward matter. Uh, uh, really inappropriate to have these funds used when it's an obligation of uh, the development to provide this housing. So, uh, all in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order number 18-004, uh, act on the request from the Shellfish Commission to approve the allocations of shellfish licenses for 2018. I'll ask the liaison to the Shellfish Conservation Commission, Councillor Hayes, to introduce this. Yes, good evening, everybody. This is, this is the annual process that, that we go through about looking at the shellfish, <coughs> shellfish licenses every year. Um, they're in front of us tonight with their recommendation, and I just reflect back a little bit of, of history. Last year at this time, there was some conversation about whether we should expand licenses or contract licenses. We did have a discussion as a council that we really were interested in seeing some survey work done and some other things, I think. They're in front of us tonight, and I think they're recommending not to make any changes because we haven't done some of the things that we, we committed to do, so we're, we're going to leave it static for now. I think that's their recommendation, and I totally support that, and I think there's some commission members that are here and some others that are interested that are here, so they may speak to it, but I think I, I support their recommendation not to increase or decrease licenses for next year. Very good, and as further introduction, uh, the chair, uh, Robert Willett, is here. If you would uh, give us a little bit of insight into... Uh, good evening, the council. Thank Robert you. Robert Willett, Three Track View Terrace. So January 9th, we uh, held our shellfish meeting and we discussed license numbers. Uh, we proposed to leave them the same. Uh, we had no opposition in that. Um, we had a unanimous vote to keep them the same. Uh, we tried to get some survey work done this year. We lacked on participating people to do the surveys. Um, I expect that you know, the gentlemen that were here last year that were pushing this would have made more of an effort to um, you know, prove what they were saying, but I guess there was no proof. So um, we're going to discuss this year on uh, possibly making it mandatory to do surveys to hold the shellfish license. And we have some other ideas for some different lottery options um, to try to maybe weed out some of the, you know, people that really want to have a license. Because, you know, maybe people that try to draw them and don't quite use them as much as people would like to see. So we'll be discussing that over the next few months with a possible ordinance change or something on that. Um, other than that, everything seems to be going good. Uh, UNE is getting involved now. Uh, we have an undergrad student, his name is uh, Curtis. And he's going to be doing a two-year study on the milky ribbon worms. Um, mm. He told us in the meeting that Scarborough has a very high volume of milky ribbon worms, yeah. uh, mm. more than he's seen in any other town that he's looked at. Um, so they're going to look into, I don't know what they're going to do, but they're going to try to do some stuff. They're talking maybe electric shock or something mm. like that. See what happens. So other than that, there's, there's not much more to report. Um, other than uh, there's going to be some some laws coming down from Augusta that are going to start affecting some of these harvesters. They're going to have to start probably icing the product down the flats and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So the state's trying to turn the page on this whole industry too and make it you know more of a viable industry. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Willett? Chris. Um, so I, I appreciate the work you guys have done. I know we've spoke a couple times. Um, it's, it's definitely not glamorous and it's, it's a lot of hard work. Can you talk to a little bit about the issue of the surveys? Because I have heard some questions about what was done, what wasn't done, maybe elaborate a little bit why. Were, were any surveys at all done this year? Uh, yeah, I conducted the survey um, with three other shellfish committee members. Um, Mr. Green was able to do half a survey because he lacked participation for his survey. Uh, the third one got canceled because we had no volunteers whatsoever. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, we're going to try to make it <coughs> mandatory to have to do the surveys. Um, the 
problem with the, the survey, but it's going to take a few years by the time you get enough data to actually crunch the numbers and know what you're actually talking about. And my, my, own, my biggest thing with the survey is it's, um, they don't have any, any type of, uh, you know, assessment on about, you know, what the predators eat and, you know, what the seagulls eat, you know, what we kill in the wintertime when we're putting them out of uh, the plans we bring. So they kind of blindside you a lot, too, because a lot of the product is, you know, I've heard people say up there, the time, so the product gets, doesn't even come to harvestable size. Some of the state biologists claim that. And of course, it varies between every single area and on how many pregnancies you have. So is it fair to say, I mean, the survey is more of a subjective analysis, right? I mean, it depends on, I mean, two people could be looking at a flat and seeing, looking at the same number of, of seed there, but have different conclusions. Is that fair? Absolutely. So, so how, do you, how do you mitigate that and manage that? Because I, I assume that's part of the basis for determining licenses, right? What's, what the potential future harvest is going to be. Yeah. It, it, it's really hard to. I mean, we have areas that, that catch seed every year, mm -hmm. and they're really, like, wet running areas and they're really hard to dig so it's really hard to get the clams out of them and so you see all these clams but then when the tide keeps coming in it keeps smothering all these clams so we never really get to harvest a lot of those clams that are actually there so uh, other areas you might have you know infestation of milky ribbon worms uh, you can identify those pretty easy they, they leave like these little humps on the flats and you can clearly see that you know, they eat all the clams right out of it. And there's clams right there on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm not really sure <laughs> on how they're going to calculate all the data on a, on a survey when you, when you add in all the different variables that, that come into it. Um, you know, it. I've been on the committee for 10 years, and even before that, I, I uh, attended meetings, and, you know, I've never seen any of them council members or anything take out a calculator and start crunching numbers mm -hmm. so it seems like it's just been like a they just you know when they want to give some out they give them out when they don't they don't that's what you know that's the problem that we're having now and when they keep the, you know discussing like the new generation you know the earth the, the, the younger generation stuff like that and they want licenses licenses Problem is, you throw 50 licenses out there. Doesn't mean any young guy's going to draw one. So that's the problem that we're having now. So we're going to have a discussion within the next, probably like the next four months. We're going to have some workshops and stuff on a different lottery process to try to, um, you know, ensure that the people that might use the license more um, have a better chance of getting one. That's that's the only way that I can really see. To, to add licenses, and like we've discussed at the uh, last selfish meeting, once we start doing that, we're actually going to have to decrease our numbers because you're going to have more active harvesters. So you're going to have to come back on your numbers just to, you know, to bring them back down because we can't support, you know, 36 commercial licenses out there full time, and it would never work. Chris. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think you know one of the things that we were discussing was you know how to how to better manage it, how to bring newer people in. And I'd like to see you guys do a little bit of focus on the and it's just me, um, a little bit more focus on the the intern program and the student program, finding a mechanism to allow those kids to continue on if they choose to, uh, because it strikes me now, if I understand it correctly, um, once their license expires, they go back into the lottery system like everybody else, and that seems to me a little counterintuitive on what a what an apprentice program should be like. So I'd be happy to work with Councillor Councilor Hayes and, and present something to you guys or come up with something to try and work through. But I, I'd like to see you guys put some focus or some emphasis on including those those student licenses and finding a good mechanism to roll those over into commercial licenses afterwards. I'm all for that if we can figure out a way to do it. I mean, you can't give every single one a license, but you can right. make a very good opportunity for uh, bulk of them maybe to have a license. <coughs> <laughs> other towns might use a program similar to that. Uh, they do it on a, I believe, as long as the student does the, the following year, that, like, when they're going to lose their license, if they still do their consultation time, 
say like four of them do it and two licenses come available, only four of them get put into the lottery. Mm -hmm. So two of them are guaranteed to get a license. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that might work a little better if the town would support something like that. So like I said, I'd be, I mean, I think I, to me a solution is much better coming from you guys than it is from us, the city. You guys are the experts, but I'd love to sit down and, and talk about some other, you know, some ideas of the best way to implement that because I do think that, you know, it is, a, it is, it's twofold, right? It's getting the younger generation engaged in it, and it's also a mechanism to allow them to continue, whether that's, you know, adding that as a separate form of license or however, whatever's the best way to approach that, the easiest way to manage it. I, I'll defer to you guys, but. Um, I'd like to see some some work in that direction. That, that would be a, to me. That's a, that's the greatest idea that we can do. Hopefully, we can get the support to do it. There's no better way to you know enroll these, these students after they're you know because basically they work with all of us commercial guys. <coughs> have a lot of students that work with me mm -hmm. all the time. Um, you know, I, I show them how to do this and, and you know the safe way of doing it and stuff like that. So <coughs> I love to see those those young guys. Be able to get a license. And, and, you know, that's probably the best way to do it, but you know, I didn't know how that would turn out to the general public if they would support something like that, too. But I would love to go that direction. If we, Robert, uh, would uh, the Shellfish uh, Conservation Commission be able to come back to us in about four months with a recommendation? Uh, and I, w I would encourage you to. We have two people who are very interested in this to assist. They're absolutely right. We'd like to have the solution come from you, people who are. Yeah. So, can yeah, we? Uh, is that, does that does that sound satisfactory? Absolutely. Uh, we kind of we kind of just set that goal at the last meeting, uh, not to bring it to the town council, but we did set a goal that we were going to try to have something in place, maybe before this this license year comes up. Uh, if they have to do conservation time or something like that, then it wouldn't come into effect in the following year. But uh, we did we did set a certain goal to to try to have something that we can go off of. Thank you. I think we'd support that to try and ar arrive at an equitable outcome. Well, that, that would be great. I'm sure there's a lot of student diggers with big smiles. On yeah. Their <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll do anything for those for, for the kids that are out there digging. They're all great kids. They, they come up and they work very hard. And it's, it's very hard to learn how to do this, mm -hmm. especially on a commercial level to where, mm -hmm. you know, you can support your family or something. Like you can't just, you know, do it whenever you want. You're really going to work at this. And you know, a lot of those kids are real hard work kids. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Willett? Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, public, uh, any comments from the public who would like to be able to address this issue. <coughs> David Green, 135 Beach Ridge Road. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I think I will because I'd like to address what Mr. Chiazzo said about student licenses being an apprentice program. That was not how it was set up. It was set up for local students to earn good money to go to college and put them out into the world and not become clam diggers, okay? <laughs> Please, don't turn the program into something it was not intended for, okay? You need to go back and look at your ordinances if you want to go take that route. I don't have a problem with it, but that's not its intended means, okay? It was intended for kids to make a good summer chunk of change to go back to school. My grandson does it. And I, I fully support the program, but you can't just say we're going to keep all these people on because the only time when you talk about license numbers is up. Now, I want to give you all something to think about. How do you get rid of a license? And how long do you think it's going to take to get rid of one license that's out there right now? I, I would make a recommendation because you've you got no data from the committee this year. You couldn't even get a landing report, did you? You didn't get any survey reports. You got no data. So you say, well, let's, let's just stay where we're at. We'll be safe. How do you know that? How do you know you're not already over too many license numbers? And I'm going to tell you, if you took four licenses back on a commercial diggers level, that's 10%. 
It'll take you 10 years to do that by attrition only, okay? And I don't want to take anybody's license away, but you need to stop looking at that because you don't have any direct control of good, better, or on, on license numbers compared to what's out there to go dick. And you don't even have a landing report this year to look at. Nobody went through that one. So where's the data? Please, we need data, okay? And surveys are not data. You put too much uh, emphasis on surveys. They mean absolutely nothing other than what Mother Nature put here because three years later, the equation doesn't come out right. Too many predators. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, anyone else wishing to address this issue? Ed Blanchett, 146 Payne Road. I've had my commercial license since 1991, and I've uh, seen a lot of different good years and bad years, and uh, the bad years are really bad, and the good years are really good, but as far as surveys go, I think if, if you're set on surveys and you need to do them, like after the summer. I think the reason why very few people, I, I didn't do any surveys. I did all crab projects. Um, I think the crabs are where you're gonna, you know, this summer you could see because it's, it's been warm the last couple of years, relatively speaking. This year we should hopefully killed off a bunch of crabs this winter. But uh, you, could, you could go dig up in Libby's River and you could just, you know, in the morning when you first get there, you could just watch the crabs march right down the river. And, and those crabs eat a lot of clams, mm. a lot of clams. And the other thing about surveys is, you know, you might survey an area, but, you know, like if you get a heavy, heavy rainfall at low tide, like, like the, the year we got the 13 inches of rain mm. there, I can't, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but Clayfitz was loaded just loaded with seed. And after that rain, you go up there and it was, it was gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the seed was completely gone. And you know, as a clam digger, you're, you're, you're thinking, oh boy, this is gonna be awesome. You know what I mean? And you're already setting, you know, you could be setting license numbers in your head and then Mother Nature just cleans it right out. Just cleans it out. And as far as the milky ribbon worms go, you know, five years ago, We'd look all over for them because they're great for stripers, catching stripers. You know, you go to certain areas and you you get a few. There weren't very many, and now there's all kinds of them. And I don't know where they, you know, I don't know how they found us, but they found us. So, you know, there's there's in my opinion there's like three big predators: there's seagulls, and we don't have any control over that, and there's milky ribbon worms, and it doesn't seem like anybody has the answer on that. And, Green crabs, hopefully they got cleaned up this winter. I mean, it was a really cold winter. But as far as surveys go, I mean, if you, if you want them real bad, then you need to schedule them in September. Because not very many people are going to do it when they're making their limits. Unless it's mandatory. <coughs> and if it's mandatory, I guess they're going to do it. But getting crabs, I think, is more, more mm -hmm. beneficial. I see. Anyone else uh, wishing to address this issue from the public? <coughs> Pardon? Can I respond? Certainly. So um, I, I just wanted to clarify something, Mr. Green. I'm, I'm not suggesting at all that every single student out there gets a license, and I don't want to dictate a solution. Um, I'm just suggesting that um, some of the comments last year were the need to get some new blood in and, and find a way to get more people engaged or more younger people engaged and I think it's a good opportunity to do that. I certainly would defer to the shellfish committee and whatever recommendation they come up with, but I do think it's worth discussing and, and moving that forward. Um, I think um, surveys were also something that was discussed last year. I agree 100% data is important. Um, part of the challenge we had last year seemed to be deciding on what data was what and what wasn't. And we talked about third parties coming in and looking at it. and. Um, so at the end of the day, we've got to find a way to manage the resource. We rely on you guys to do that. You're out there. We trust you. Um, but, you know, there is, there, there is some room for improvement, I think, and hopefully we'll move in that direction. Uh, accept a motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. We have 
uh, commitment from Mr. Willett to get us uh, something within four months. And thank you. Uh, ready to vote? All in favor. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Item number eight, non-action items. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, order number 18005. Act to approve the resolve to accept donations for the fuel assistance program. Anyone wishing to uh, address us on that matter, please approach the podium. Let's see if I can find that. Resolve accepting donations for the fuel assistance program. Be it hereby resolved by the town council as follows. The town of Scarborough gratefully accepts the pledges and donations from the following business and, and persons that have been collected to date to be used for the fuel assistance program, uh, citing Mr. and Mrs. Jeffrey Ertman uh, as having made a contribution. And be it further resolved that each business organization or person be recognized for their generous donations as a token of the town's appreciation. Accept a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Jim Ray. As you all know, <laughs> I, I actually left some seat bags up there too that goes to the fuel assistance program. This is a really uh, critical uh, program in town, and as any of you who had trouble getting oil or propane delivered, even if you were a regular customer, um, know that. Um, yeah, for people who didn't have regular deliveries, and that's a lot of mainers. They do cash, you know, when they've got the cash, they fill up. And um, anything I think that we can do through Project Grace um, and in the, this um, liaison this, uh, that we've got with, with them through the town is most helpful. And there is a fuel assistance rally the first weekend in February, I know I can't go to it because I've got something else. I want to say it's February, I don't even want to say the 10th, something like that. Not sure. But anyway. We'll certainly publicize the date. Yeah, please come. <coughs> please donate. And thank you to the Ertmans for making it. Thank you. Others? Chris? So um, I did want to just point out that I uh, say thank you to the Ertmans. They're very active in the community across mm -hmm. the board, um, done a lot of work with uh, the schools, even after their 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 children have graduated and moved on, I think Jeff still comes back and plays a mean trombone with the band from time to time when they uh, need help in the brass section. So, I um, certainly appreciate their their efforts across the board. Um, I did just get a fuel oil delivery, and it was not cheap. So, supply and demand, obviously, mm -hmm. prices are extremely high right now, and every little contribution helps, for sure. Thank you, Will. Oh, I was going to echo the exact same sentiment that, that uh, uh, Jeff and Deborah are incredibly generous with their time and money, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, standing special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, John, let's sit down with you. Absolutely. Um, so uh, the, uh, the library liaison tomorrow is our first board meeting of the year, so I'll be able to report at the next meeting on progress. And I believe um, uh, the library director has reached out um, and asking to have a, um, a meeting workshop with the council, so we will have that pretty soon. We'll get information. Um, appointments committee will be meeting on January 29th, which is the is a Monday at 5:30 here in Chambers. Um, so we have a lot of work to do to catch up because we're a little bit behind. And um, that's all I have for committee reports. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. So as I alluded to um, when I was introducing the, um, the, the ordinance earlier, um, the Scarborough Housing Alliance is very close to having a um, draft of an RFP to be presented back to the town council that we'd like to get out um, uh, this winter. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping and see they're going to come back the next meeting or, or shortly thereafter, but, um, but they're making great progress there. Um, the, um, I have one item that actually crosses two different committees. Um, the Southgate House uh, is being developed by uh, Avesta Housing into affordable units. Um, they've done some 
demolition there. Uh, they're also um, applying for uh, historic credits, and I think as part of that process, mm -hmm. that property has been uh, nominated to the National Registry of Historic Places, um, and um, that's being supported by historic, the Historic Preservation Implementation Committee, um, which also met. And um, it was a really interesting meeting. The um, uh, developers uh, and current owners of the proprietors meeting house and parish house, um, which is at the um, on County Road at the, on the Buxton line, um, came to kind of talk about what they're proposing um, in terms of restoration. And it's a it's a, a perfect use for that um, location. They're, they they want to use it for. Um, events and so it's a beautiful old church built in 1839, uh, and um, has a parish house next to it. And they want to rent it out for weddings or and other events, and they have a night. They have some um, slight modifications that they want to make, but um, they they have some flexibility with the committee, and it, it was a really, really terrific discussion. So thank you to um, write down their names. So J J Chase came by with Jason Haskell and Mark Tibbetts. Thank you, Katie. Uh, the Conservation Committee met uh, to work on and approve their final, the final document for the comprehensive plan, their submission, their piece of it, which does address uh, a lot of concerns around the sea level rise and uh, emergency preparedness and, and are we ready for that. So um, we will, that's going to come before Council uh, Shortler, actually no, it's not, it's going to Long Range Planning first and then mm -hmm. before it comes back to us. So. Um, also, uh, Eastern Trail Alliance, as everyone knows, they filled the gap with the help of uh, Maine DLT, and uh, they have one more full group meeting. It's been a pretty large group that's been working uh, on those efforts over the past year or two or more, and um, then they're going to, but they're going to be kind of reassessing whether that group needs to stay intact or whether they need to condense as they start to move into the next phase, which is really more of the design and, and the permitting phase of the project. So. Um, that will be forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right. Um, yeah, communications met and we had an initial meeting, uh, reviewed uh, some of the information we were able to gather from what went on last year. And we are going to work on a goal and also it sounds like we have a few action items to look at after this meeting today. Ordinance tomorrow has been postponed. We will not be meeting tomorrow because we don't have anything to meet on, but we will be meeting on February 15th at, I can't remember which time which one is, but 4.30 on ordinance. Uh, the next communications meeting, in case you are interested in, in following it or attending, is February 8th. The seniors uh, postponed their meeting uh, due to weather and whatever, uh, but our next meeting is on to February 13th. I did look up and fuel rally is February 10th. So that's it. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, just kind of a quick update. I think I kind of a shout out to the shellfish goose as we were discussing what they did mention, but I thought it's really worth paying attention to and really kind of a shout out to David Green. A year ago, he had reached out to the University of New England to see if they could do some work on the milky worm and just try to figure out why Scarborough was being so impacted when other communities are not. And actually a grad student came. He came in front of the committee the last time they met. He's got a two-year commitment to do this, but the work will continue. He's actually asked, he's trying to create a, a poll and a survey that as all the clamors are going out, wherever they see the milky worms, they're gonna start keeping a record of the soil, the type of soil, where they're finding them, the temperatures. So it's, I, it's really, thank you University of New England, it's really important work that's being done and hopefully we'll start to get some answers about some of the predators that are in our water. So just wanted to give a shout out and say that's great work that's going on. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Chris. So energy was supposed to meet this morning, but it was postponed due to snow until next week. Um, transportation met last night. We went over um, quite a few things. We looked at um, some adaptive traffic signal controls for the Route 1 quarter, specifically for the Dunstan area. That's something that we're looking at um, proposing as a test section um, for, for adaptive street controls. And the goal of that is to try and help traffic move a little bit smoother. Um, it's not quite like the, you know, we get too technical, it's not like the loops where it does a timing thing, it does more, um, uh, it's a little bit of a smarter application um, to 
looking at traffic flow and managing the lights and signals and things like that. So that's certainly something that's going to be moving forward. Um, we reviewed the comprehensive plan and the transportation issues surrounding it um, and got some general updates on Eastern Trail um, as well as the uh, regional transportation management systems for Payne Road and Route 22 as well, which is, um, again, more of a traffic control signal kind of thing that, the, that are regionally controlled so that traffic flowing, let's say, from uh, the main mall um, to Pleasant Hill uh, across Payne Road is all controlled contiguously through one system. So um, it's just a way to kind of help traffic flow a little bit smoother through that. Those are, those are part issues that need to be done and accommodated as part, believe it or not, of, of the east-west connector because we have to look at viable alternatives um, to funding an east-west connector and one of the things we're doing is maximizing the transportation and the flow in the existing roads so that we could um, look at that and see if expansion is possible or if that's the area to, to put the traffic on versus an east-west corridor. So all these are preliminary steps. That east-west corridor uh, connection from the turnpike to Gorham is a, a long ways off, but we're starting that, that kind of preliminary process of looking at traffic flows and things like that now. Thank you. Uh, town manager's report. <coughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of points of interest. Uh, it is very busy early in the year, so I think that speaks to uh, what I think will be a busy year and hopefully a successful year. I think I made the observation to Councillor Hayes when I was talking with him. I feel a bit overwhelmed, uh, the, you know, juggling all these balls, and I don't want any one of them to hit the ground. They're all kind of equally important, so um, it's an exciting time right now, for sure. Uh, in terms of community engagement, uh, Julie Kugerberger and myself have engaged uh, the community twice now, twice last week and well, once last week, uh, once yesterday and two times next week on what we're billing as listen to learn. The intention there was uh, as we form our budgets and working with our senior staff is to receive input from the residents in terms of what they like, what they don't like, what services they favor, what they like less of or more of. Uh, not surprisingly, it's really turned into more of a kind of give and take of information. And judging from the first two sessions by kind of asking the participants if they like the flow of information, uh, they seem to like that and we're pleased to accommodate. So to the extent that there's a question that we have a readily available answer, we do our best to provide that. And inevitably it uh, spawns uh, a follow-up question. And so there, there's been a good exchange of information and even among the participants. Uh, they're talking among themselves, and that's equally good. So I think each of them have run about 90 minutes, and my assessment is we've kind of run the table, uh, we've kind of run through the list of questions on the, on the front of their mind anyway. So that format seems to be working well. Um, the other part of this engagement strategy will involve many of you, all of you, I hope, in what I think we're building as kind of a neighborhood outreach or road show. So <coughs> been presented and kind of out there in the community is for you then to get some really budget specific reaction. <coughs> so it'll be interesting to see um, how this continues over the whole process. But we've been very gratified. The first session had 29 participants and yesterday was 24. Yeah. And so there, I think there really is something to switching up the venue and the time of day. Uh, the first one we offered childcare and then we took advantage of it. Um, and yesterday <coughs> we offered free transportation should continue. To so I think going to those extra yeah. um, efforts really, uh, I think, will make some differences. On the public safety building front, things are really picked up speed. We, uh, I think, I reported last time we have engaged context architecture to continue the design and construction phase. Um, we are going through a selection process for a construction manager. This is the company who would actually build the building for us. Uh, and also a separate process for an owner's rep to make sure that our interests are represented. And it's really critical to get both these folks on early in the process because we really want them to collaborate through starting and design. Uh, interviews for both those positions are next Thursday, so I would say in the next month or so we should have those things uh, very well in hand. The property itself is actually formally listed. Um, it's out there and available in the marketplace. Uh, signs have gone up and I'm pleased to say that there's been a fair amount of interest. Uh, actually, uh, have received a formal offer that was um, surprisingly low, but nonetheless, uh, that's <laughs> part, of the, part of the process. But there's, every day there's inquiries and uh, we're sh we're, my goal is to have at least a show in the week and so far so good. Um, the master campus plan, this is something members of council had heard probably a year ago. We had to kind of break that into two pieces, really driven by the public safety building 
uh, process that was going full tilt. So we focused on essentially the campus from where we're sitting towards Sawyer Road first and completed that. We've now dropped back to include the rest of the campus. And our landscape architecture firm has come up with some really interesting concepts in terms of what the development potential that exists. The big looming question is really uh, whether the school department is interested in going forward with a consolidated uh, K-2 school or pre-K-2 school. Uh, just the sheer size of the school to accommodate that many students uh, is a real big consideration. So right now that's included in the concept plans, but we really need the school to make some um, maybe final decisions in terms of what the preference is. Uh, we expect and would like to make a presentation of this uh, in the coming months to the council and I'll work with the council chair for a, a workshop. Sure. Uh, this is kind of a, a detail, but I think you might like to know uh, workers' comp insurance is a huge cost to us uh, given the number of employees and the type the nature of the work. Mm -hmm. um, we expect that we're going to have a savings of about $60,000 this year based on the fact that our experience modification has mm -hmm. gone from a one, which which simply means that we're going to, our experience will be average what someone else would be down to a 0.85, so we're 15% better. And that translates obviously into real dollars. So I applaud my staff for their commitment mm -hmm. to uh, safety and safety committees. Uh, that's exactly how it moves to the um, Along the lines of workshops, Councilor Donovan and I have been working and fielding all sorts of inquiries over the next couple of months. We pretty much have it booked, so you can expect uh, workshops before each council meeting. We hope that format works for you. Um, you've got the night scheduled out and trying to be efficient with your time. So I'll do a quick rundown. At your next meeting, we'll be meeting with the folks in the Crossroads Development, uh, Scarborough Downs. Um, following that uh, will be my evaluation, I believe the executive session. And then in March, we have a stormwater workshop, which I'm sure we're all waiting with bated breath. <laughs> Uh, it's part of the annual training, but there will also be some details on some of the detailed watershed planning uh, mm -hmm. efforts that we've undertaken. And lastly, uh, first meeting in April, we have booked in the library trustees. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I just want to foreshadow a matter that perhaps some of you have heard um, from Councillor Donovan on. Um, this is a potential opportunity, I'll pitch it as, uh, for conducting a commercial industrial revaluation. Re and I, I characterize it as an opportunity because this is something that has been, in my mind, really since our defeat at the polls back in 2014. I can't believe it's been that long, frankly. But I'm not, I've been unwilling and, frankly, unable to advance, uh, seriously advance this idea. The need certainly has not gone away. It's only gotten worse. Mm. Uh, but, frankly, uh, only until recently, the last couple of months, have I had the sort of stability and leadership in the assessing office to feel comfortable <coughs> to even explore this. I didn't want to move it forward without the sort of uh, background support to make it successful. Um, and so I really wanted to test the marketplace. So I, I, with no commitments, I put an RFP out, and I was pleased that two respondents, all of my respondents uh, responded, and I was really surprised that they could actually do it uh, in time for the next commitment. And that's, that's how I pitch it as an opportunity. Uh, it is a bit out of cycle. Um, we could start with wait to the budget cycle, but I put in front of you, and I think I'd be remiss not to make you aware of the opportunity to move at least part of this forward. And it, you might ask, uh, you know, I guess the other part of that uh, in terms of why now is we again were, con the, the need was confirmed through our annual analysis of sales to assessment ratios. And as has been the trend, uh, commercial industrial is actually looking at 76% of the Average mm -hmm. at this point, or the average is 76% of value. So, as a class of properties, it's by far the worst. Um, so, that's the other reason why we're kind of focusing on this. Um, and just to put a finer point to that, uh, by my calculations, that could be uh, in the order of $175 million of unrealized value that, it, that does actually exist, but we're not showing it. Uh, and that's certainly meaningful. Uh, this could be considered as kind of the first phase to restoring equity back into the system, and clearly, this would be predicated. Uh, this would pred this would come before um, the residential component, which would need to follow almost immediately thereafter. I have full intentions of putting in 
uh, funding request in the FY19 budget to complete the residential piece, and that will be a matter of discussion among you. Um, but I'd like to advance uh, the opportunity as soon as your next meeting to at least consider this option. And what I'd be asking for is the resources to be able to, be able to, to do this out of budget cycle. Um, so I know I'm hitting you with a lot of information. I do have a memorandum I'm working on, and I expect to have that out in your hands by the end of the week. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if this is the right form to take questions on that, or I'm pleased to talk to you individually as well. So my question is just, you, you made reference to a defeat in the polls in 2014. Could you, could you elaborate on that? We put a town-wide evaluation question, uh, referendum question to the voters, and I don't remember the, the vote tally, but it was fairly soundly defeated, as I recall. Now, admittedly, in hindsight, we did no kind of public relations around the matter, and I guess, not surprisingly, there's a lot of folks that there's a lot of mystery associated with the assessments. And the general rule of thumb is a third go up, a third stay the same, a third um, go down, actually. Uh, but um, for whatever reason, the voters um, did not want to advance that. Thank you. Other questions of the town manager? It's not really a question. If I can just add, because you know, sometimes the information is going to be a, so. Keep in mind that when that was posted um, and sent out, it was, the reason why it was sent out is because of the cost and the source of funding was bonding. It wasn't whether or not we needed to do it; it's whether or not we wanted to spend four hundred thousand dollars in a bond rather than operational cash, because we would, didn't have to go to the uh, voters if we did if we funded it by cash. It was only because we right. needed to bond it. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And then for certain sectors, in this one in particular, we're reaching kind of a statutory threshold and we want to do it. And, uh, and that's 70%. So I think that's in our future if we don't do something sooner. And when was the last time it was done? Uh, 2004, I believe. <coughs> Long time. Other questions for the town manager? <coughs> Councilor, comments? Uh, Sean, let's start down with you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, first, um, we haven't met in a long time, <coughs> um, so a couple of uh, uh, issues that have kind of been surfacing. So I, I wanted to uh, congratulate Crossroads Development and the Respira family and the Michel family and the whole Scarborough Downs. So, and I think it's extremely exciting. Um, for many, many years, we've always uh, kind of wondered what was going to happen and where would we go. And so I think this is going to be an exciting journey um, about the growth and the future of Scarborough. It's going to be very interesting. So. Um, I, and it's nice to see, not that other uh, investors or other buyers wouldn't have been welcomed, but it's nice to see two local families um, come together and to, uh, um, to, you know, to invest back into the community, although they have always invested back in the community. Wanted to also mention, if you didn't see in the Portland Press Herald, Scarborough's own Owen Garrard, if mm -hmm. I pronounced that correctly, was the uh, 2017 FITSI Award winner. Uh, for Maine High School um, football players. So uh, he is obviously the first from Scarborough, but he's also one of the first from um, a smaller school than some of the bigger schools that have been represented in the past. So I wanted to congratulate him because that's pretty exciting. <coughs> I work with a young man from Sanford who was a nominee many years ago, and he said holding that, uh, the Fitzy Award, it's like 75 pounds. I mean, it's just this monstrous thing that you just feel a lot of pride just to being able to hold. So congratulations to him and to the school and to his team because it's, it's really representative of the whole community. And then last, I wanted to mention with the notice of the Eastern Trail um, Alliance and filling in the gap, um, and I don't know the date. I was trying to get onto Facebook through here, but I don't have it on here because I, I knew if I checked O'Reilly's Cures Facebook page, it would be um, there. But I think what a, what a great way to um, celebrate that success um, by having more people sign up for the John Andrews Memorial ETA 5K race that is sponsored by O'Reilly's Cure. Patrick and Sue O'Reilly started it last year. I want to say they raised almost $100,000 last year. So while they may have may not need the money to fill the gap, I hope that they continue that uh, tradition. John was actually long, long time supporter of the Eastern Trail. He was a Scarborough resident, lived over on Hillside, or I'm sorry, Hillcrest. Um, an incredible person. If you ever had a chance to meet him, so um, you know maybe it's something. I might not be able to run a 5K, but I'd love to join and walk with anybody else, um, <laughs> or you know maybe get pushed along in a. <laughs> in a car or something, but we'll figure something out. But I think it would be a, a really nice uh, kudos for this community to come together for that. 
Last year, I think it was May 20th or May 19th, somewhere around that, so maybe it's the same this year. And uh, with that, I just want to ask everyone to keep safe and warm during this uh, snowy weather. Thank you. Will? I have nothing tonight. Thank you. Okay. Um, so most of you know uh, I bought a new home in November, and I am new to the world of propane heating. Never <laughs> had propane heating before, and so... Uh, unbeknownst to me, I, I was unaware of how that worked and how you could only, the tanks were rented and you could only get the fuel through that one service provider. So I was one of thousands of folks out there who have been, uh, who paid for fuel well over a month ago, um, but was waiting and waiting mm -hmm. and waiting and uh, did finally get my fuel delivery today, but um, I did want to just thank uh, some of our local legislators because they were very responsive uh, to our inquiries and like how to what can we do um, I know representative Siraki reached out to the Energy Commissioner right away and got a response and and so working uh, you know I think across the aisle and it was not a you know it was a very bipartisan issue everybody needs to be warm and uh, they were very they moved swiftly to enact some legislation to be able to allow fuel companies to um, you know if, if they had the capacity to uh, be able to deliver fuel to people uh, with some waivers. So um, I thought that was a, I think it was a little scary to me that it took so long for something like that to be able to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, hopefully that will have everybody putting their heads together. But I definitely appreciated the effort and uh, hope that if those of you who are out there are still waiting, that you do get fuel soon um, and know that those waivers are now in place, I believe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jay Murray. Um, the only thing I wanted to do was to thank Tom and Julie for doing the, the uh, Listen to Learns. I've heard a lot of really positive feedback from constituents regarding it, regarding the format, and I was able to attend um, the one yesterday. I was a little late, but yeah, it was, it, I think the format works really well. So thank you for the time. I know it's a lot of time out of your day. Uh, and Julie's uh, to do that. Um, also, I, I forgot to mention, I'm going to Augusta tomorrow um, for the Legislative Policy Committee meeting for Maine Municipal, so I will be reporting uh, back on that. If you, may, you may or may not be aware that in the second part of the regular sessions, they are allegedly <laughs> just emergency bills or funding bills that come forward, so there aren't as many bills, but the big hot topic is uh, marijuana, um, so I will have more information for all of you as to where that seems to be heading, because um, we do need to do some work on whatever comes out of there in the ordinance. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Chris. So I, I just wanted to reiterate and thank uh, my fellow counselors for the retreat that we had. I thought it was very productive um, and, and very well spent. Um, I also wanted to comment, um, uh, if any of you have had it yet this year, the flu is nasty. <laughs> I had it uh, last week, but it's not too late for others out there. If you haven't had it, if you're in the risk category, get a shot because it's brutal. It is brutal. So um, that's all. It's, I, I, I've been reading in the papers, it's record record outbreaks across the country and the weather's not helping. So um, there's a lot of vulnerable people at risk. So I would encourage you if you get the opportunity to get a shot because it's Beats the alternative. Mm -hmm. I stopped by Walgreens the other day because they give them. They're all free. Yeah, for free. Mm -hmm. so, um, I had mentioned that uh, uh, I had done a bit of a uh, audit of the senior property tax relief program, and I just did want to report to all of you on on that. Uh, I spent a few hours checking uh, each of the applications that had been submitted, a little over 300, uh, for the income levels because I wanted to make sure that we were actually serving the community that we were seeking to serve. Two-thirds uh, of those uh, who were receiving uh, this aid were under $30,000. Uh, so that was a very encouraging. Ninety percent of them were under $40,000. So it was... Uh, we were serving the uh, people who would benefit from this. Uh, Tom and I met with Sue Russo <coughs> to debrief uh, the assessing department's experience. 
we did identify that a small number of people uh, uh, who did not qualify were not qualifying under unusual circumstances. And this was <coughs> that they were uh, owners in one of our three mobile home parks uh, and that they involve, and it involves a hybrid tax situation where the property owner of the mobile home received a tax bill for the value, based on the value of the structure, but that they had an underlying land lease uh, for which they were paying uh, a payment to the owner of the land, the operator of the uh, park. Uh, Tom Andrew and I talked it over. We considered this to be uh, an appropriate circumstance for interpreting our ordinance as covering this and that that would be uh, something that we would like to see happen. I think the ordinance committee is gonna look at that <clears throat> to perhaps make it even clearer. So uh, I think we'll, it will give us a chance to, along with our goals that we talked about today of helping seniors and the senior property tax relief program, certainly there's, there's an instance, and we'll see what happens to, to it next year, what kind of impact it has. Uh, but it, uh, it was a positive development uh, to do the work. <coughs> uh, I did want to just, just for the benefit of the public, I've been refraining from really speaking to the property tax appeal by uh, a large group of appellants at <coughs> three beach communities, but it's out there, it's a lot of money. Uh, uh, so this is a, a, a case where they believed they were overassessed. Uh, the case went to trial. Uh, the town won. Uh, went to the Supreme Court. The town uh, uh, position was upheld. Uh, you would think that would be the end of it. But there was uh, unrelated issues that didn't involve any of the properties uh, of the appealing parties that has lingered on. And I will save you the gory details of that. Uh, uh, suffice, suffice it to say, it is a complex, as exceedingly complex area of constitutional law as you'll probably ever come across, uh, and uh, uh, and made for a difficult situation. Uh, in any event, the uh, parties, the town and the plaintiffs, have agreed to return to mediation. Uh, we will be before the same mediator uh, as we were before and this is scheduled to resume on March the 5th. So more to come uh, later this winter on that. Uh, I was glad that the town manager was able to report on the partial reval. This is uh, an uh, unusually low percentage that commercial industrial has fit. Uh, by focusing on just that, I think we can have it done for that's what the contract commitment is. Uh, uh, the people who have uh, responded to the RFP have said they can meet uh, our commitment date in August so as to allow it to be a part of this. Uh, it, to me, it's an equity issue. Uh, it's clear that the town's residential side has carried a disproportionate portion of the burden uh, in recent years, and here's now an opportunity in a two-step phase to get the commercial uh, in this year uh, and the residential next year, it's overdue. Uh, I was uh, attending the listening sessions. I thought they were, uh, I've attended all of our budget forums and, uh, and I didn't think that there was a good give and take. Uh, we had a lot of municipal people there, but the discussion never seemed to have the kind of comfort and uh, a responsiveness that I thought was necessary for a topic as important as the budget. Well, these sessions were both terrific. Uh, it was intimate. There was 25, 30 people in the room. Uh, they were, uh, it was a small space. They were given the opportunity to follow up questions. The answers were very direct. Uh, uh, Julie and Tom were very responsive and I think we have found a way to be able to reach out. It may actually be applicable to more circumstances than just the budget. Uh, certainly the questions were further afield than just the budget. Uh, 
on uh, the and my the last point. Uh, I was so glad that Sean brought up the Fitzpatrick Trophy uh, uh, for uh, Owen Gerard, and uh, I found the article in the newspaper in the Portland Press Herald this week on it. it was very refreshing because yep. the first thing he thanked was his offensive line. And I, I thought that was uh, uh, anyone who's ever... As a former running back yourself. As anyone who's ever had a running back, those are the people you love. So with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's one. Okay.